Right, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another edition hey! of The Carton Show. Uh, week four in the NFL is now well underway. We've got my main man, Mr. Super Bowl champion, Willie awesome. Cologne. We've got Principal Belding, I'm sorry, David <laughs> Jacoby here as well. Good morning, and class. And we've got you. It is Friday. We had football last night, so let's get cracking with Friday morning. Headlines. Well, someone here sat there, oh, two of us as a matter of fact, yep. told you yep. that the Detroit Lions uh, should be favored in Green Bay because they're a better team than the Green Bay Packers. 34 to 20. The Detroit Lions say it again. The Detroit Lions are now in first place yes. and they own the NFC North. The Green Bay Packers only had one yard in the first quarter, <laughs> only had 20 yards in the first half, and they were playing catch up the whole night long. Matt LaFleur at the end of his press conference said, hey, man, we was humbled and we was embarrassed. First of all, just because Little Wayne runs you out the tunnel doesn't mean you own the building, right? <laughs> so I was, I was shocked by that. I thought the Packers were going to win. I thought Jordan Love was going to be that guy. When they label you the franchise, the face of the franchise, that means you sell jerseys. That means you put butts in seats. I didn't want to watch him yesterday after the first no, half. It, it was, was bad. And I know they struggled up front. They were missing David Bakhtiari and Ellen, uh, you know, Elton Jenkins. But, man, that was, that was tough to see for the Packers. Yeah, not only that, I mean, I give them credit. They fought back a little bit in the second half. Bit. They had a two-point right. conversion away from at least making it a one-score game. When they didn't, they were down 10. Midway through the fourth quarter, the game was a wrap, and Detroit added yep. you know, another touchdown to really put it away. But, you know, we all sat here yesterday. We thought, wow, you know, Aaron Jones is coming back. That's going to help. They only ran the ball 10 times yesterday. Not even that, man. We thought this was going to be a lot explosive, a lot more explosive offense. I thought Romeo Dobbs having Watson back in the building, all that was going to come into fruition. It didn't. I'm worried about Jordan Love at this point because he seemed rattled in the first half. I can understand the second half if you take a beating, but the first quarter he looked like he was shell shocked. I'm worried about you. You sound sick. I'm going to sit over here. I'm a little nasally. I'll apologize. He's a little nasal. That's what happens when you go to bed at one o'clock in the morning because you're doing your job, watching hard, working hard, watching football game. All right, headline number two. Uh, you could argue, I suppose, that this isn't the biggest matchup of the week, but I think it's certainly top two or three, and that's the Bills and the Dolphins in Buffalo. And again, every week Miami's looking to prove to people that we are for real. At some point, we're all going to accept it, that they are maybe the best team in the AFC. They can take a major step towards that by beating the Bills in Buffalo. Yeah, Bills have to keep up, man. They, the, we, don't, we talk a lot about the Miami Dolphins, but the Bills are right behind them. And you talk about what Miami did last week, having 22 plays over 10-plus yards. I mean, they're efficient. They're juggling now. I'm not worried about the Bills' defense. I think they're going to be fine. It's about can this Bills' offense keep up with Miami? Yeah, I can't wait to watch that game. Obviously, the winner of that game, first place. Uh, the Bills are coming off that uh, embarrassing loss yeah. to the Jets in week one. That would be uh, ancient history if they beat Miami on Sunday. Looking forward to that matchup. Headline number three, Dallas Cowboys looking to rebound after their embarrassing loss against the Arizona Cardinals. Yes. They're also honoring Ezekiel Elliott in some uh, way, shape, or form. Uh, I suppose before the game, because uh, it would be weird to do it at halftime since he's not wearing a Cowboy jersey. But uh, it's the return of Ezekiel to Dallas. New England trying to win their second consecutive game. And Dallas trying to get back to the win column before next week's big game against the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, if the Patriots win this game, this breaks the Cowboys' nine-game home winning streak. Yes. Can you imagine the press conference from Jerry no. Jones on Monday? It also puts case. blood in the water 100%. that the Cowboys aren't for real. Well, they're on the precipice of two and three if they don't win this game because the, the 49ers are lurking past this game, and we all know Bill Belichick's going to put together a defense that's going to make it difficult on deck. This is not an easy win for them. And headline number four as we get started here on a football Friday. Friday. Maybe the greatest still photograph I've seen that didn't have Christian Harper in it. And it is my quarterback right oh, there. Where's the not boot? He not arrives. wearing. Why is he not wearing the boot? Because oh, that's how advanced his recovery is. Is he playing on Sunday? He is Card. not wearing a boot. I, Has I he been ruled out for Sunday? Has no. Has he been ruled out? Not yet. Okay. I tore my Achilles. I was in a boot for a month. Yeah. I'm surprised he's not in the booth. He's Speed well, Speed again, bridge. to be fair, you also didn't have a hyperbaric chamber in your crib. Okay. Yeah. You also didn't have a pool with dolphins yeah, in sure. it. Uh, and to, right? the, yeah. and yeah. that type of recovery okay. situation. But that is a sight for sore eyes. That tells me Aaron Rodgers is not only going to be in the building on Sunday night uh, to counteract the Taylor Swift effect with the Kansas City Chiefs, he's playing football again this year. 
I love that picture. Is that what you get from that picture? <laughs> That's what I get, yeah. I did not get this. I was joking around yeah, about yeah. him being available. No, but yeah. Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we could just oh, stay near 500 we, yeah. by Thanksgiving. After the bye? We play the Chiefs on After Sunday. the bye. After the bye well, week. not this week, of course. <laughs> but I'm saying yeah, the future games that the Jets have coming up. I love that. He's wearing a sleeve. He's not wearing a boot. He's not wearing, like, a leg immobilizer. But you want to see him in a boot. You know what? No, I don't. He's on a slick pavement. He can, like, he can get hurt. Why is he alone? Oh, oh okay. Oh. You say that now. Okay. Word is he's wearing Skechers, and you never slip in Skechers. All right, listen. <laughs> we got a great show for you coming up. Uh, the guys will give you their picks much later on in the show. But, of course, the Jets are playing the Chiefs. Uh, it seems like it's a Taylor Swift concert at MetLife uh -oh. Stadium. But uh, the Jets, can they somehow find a way, a recipe, if you will, to beat Kansas City Sunday night? We'll get into that right after this. Uh, obviously, tons of great matchups. I'm not sure that this counts as one of them, but it's interesting. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs Sunday night, MetLife Stadium against the beleaguered New York Jets. The Jets offensive coordinator, as you know, is a guy named Nathaniel Hackett, Broncos head coach last year. He was asked about the offensive woes and how they plan on fixing them and who's to blame and all that good stuff. Here's Nathaniel Hackett. Go ahead. I think that we put our entire offense into some really bad situations. Uh, it doesn't matter who's back there, quarterback, who's playing. When you're behind the sticks, when you're third and extra long continuously, it's not going to be good, and we have to be better. Uh, that's the biggest bunch of crap I've heard uh, in the, uh, all week, as a matter of fact. I don't understand why they are so reluctant to say what I know they think, what I know they see, what we all see, and what Zach himself knows about his performance. He's not been very good. So when you ask Nathaniel Hackett about Zach Wilson, at quarterback, why not just say, look, here's the reality. Yeah. We're hamstrung with this kid at quarterback. We have to play call differently. We have to protect differently. And it's negatively impacting our entire offense. Instead, well, it's not just Zach's fault. It's everybody's fault. I don't understand why that's still the messaging. Because they have empathy, and they're sitting around watching us talk about Zach just like the rest of the nation. And so at some point, they try to protect this kid because they have no other options. And you understand, if they go to Tim Boyle or maybe a Trevor Simeon, that's, they're done with Zach Wilson. I don't know how you can bring him back on the field okay. if that's the case. So I think this but is... But let me saying, stop you there. Why do I got to bring him back? With Zach Wilson? Well, because at this point, I don't think they know what they have in Tim Boyle. I don't, I don't know I how far they can go back into the crate and keep pulling out quarterbacks when you're trying to get this team to play every Sunday. So I think it's right now, they have to believe in Zach. They have to continue to talk life into Zach. And by the way, his press conference yesterday, I was impressed. With I don't Zach. Know, with Zach. Yes. I thought he handled extremely well. Zach was asked, uh, we're not showing it to you right now, but yes. Zach was asked about the Aaron Rodgers comments. He was asked about the Joe Namath yes. comments. And to his credit, you know, he didn't shy away from it. And he said, my job is to prove everybody wrong. Prove wrong. You know, that they got it wrong, that I am good enough to lead the New York Jets to wins, especially against a tough opponent like the Kansas City Chiefs. It showed maturity, Craig. And, and uh, for me, for looking at this offense, can they be better? But they can be better by exploiting more options. So why not do this? Just And I, I may be dead wrong in asking this question, so you know, you know, attack me if you have to. Gotcha. And I'll respect that. Why not then call an offense like you have a real quarterback? Because what I've seen thus far Fair. is an offense that they're not willing to allow Zach Wilson to go out there and make the mistakes they're also afraid of. Because I think the narrative with Zach Wilson is just don't blow the game. Let the defense win it for you. And that's been the story for him since last year. Now you're looking at this team right now that needs more production out of him. And I think he's like, hey, man, you gave me the menu. I'm just trying to follow the script. You want me to be this safe, boring quarterback. Now you want me to be this gunslinger who makes plays in, within the pocket and, and is mobile. Who do you want me to be? So I think he's dealing with an identity crisis. Yeah. I think he doesn't know who he is or what he wants to do with this offense. And I don't think Nathaniel Hackett has any more answers for him. I will well. tell you this. Him being a pocket quarterback is not what that kid is. You know, one of the reasons the Jets who fell in love with him is his ability to get out of the pocket yes. and throw on the run. Yes. Not a lot of quarterbacks do that well. And believe it or not, he, he does actually do does do really that well. pretty well. Uh, not much else, of course, <laughs> but that's about what he does. Here's my very quick take, Jacoby. You know, we all we break this down, and I think we get lazy on it. And we say, oh, Zach Wilson can't beat the Kansas City Chiefs. What about my defense? Right? Well, thus far this year, the Kansas City offense has not been explosive. Granny Kelsey missed the game. I get all that. Their wide receivers don't scare anybody. One guy does, and that's the quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, who, yes, I recognize, can make anybody look like a rock star wide receiver. 
But I keep being told, and I went back and I checked my notes on Did this. Did you notes? <laughs> the New York Jets told me over and over and over and over again that we have one of the greatest defenses ever. When do I see that? Like, when do they do their job? And I don't want the excuse of, well, they're on the field for 40 minutes, so you can't expect them. No, no. I can expect them to because they told me that they were that good. Well, I'm going to go back to what you said after Aaron Rodgers went down and they beat the Bills. And you said something, as someone who knows the Jets well, you said, here's how we're going to win games. Yeah. Running the ball and playing great defense. Facts. And we haven't seen those two elements. When Aaron Rodgers is out and you have Zach Wilson, who we all know is limited as a quarterback, you have Brees Hall and Dalvin Cook, you have to run the ball. And then you go to the defense side. The defense is great. They need to win games for this yes, team. Yes, they do. The way you see other defenses win games. And right now, they've played well, but they haven't tilted a game. No. They haven't, they haven't been the reason that they put themselves even in a position to win. And that's what they need to do against the Chiefs. Now, I will give them credit. Three interceptions and the fumble recovery against the Bills in right. week one. Yep. And we won that game on a special teams play with Gibson's up punt return, uh, touchdown, and overtime. Uh, that being said, I'd like to see those 11 guys on defense actually dominate a game. You know, you've seen the Chiefs' offense struggle. They scored 17 points against the Jaguars, right? The Jets' defense is better than the Jaguar defense. It's time to step up and be the reason you at least have a chance to win. And I'm going to be the only guy in America that's going to say this. I don't think the Chiefs blow them out. I don't think you get what you got last night yes, the where it's 27-3 to three at halftime. I agree. I don't, I, now, I'm not picking the Jets to win, obviously. That would be stupid. But I do think the Jets show some pride early on in this game and make it interesting. But I also think it's up to Rob Sala to change his scheme. He plays his cloud defense, Bimba don't break, right? He wants to keep everything in front of them and make them earn their yards. But at this point, your front four hasn't been able to get after the quarterback. Mm-hmm. We watch Aiden Hutchinson. We, we've watched Michael Parsons. We watch all TJ Watt. Yeah. We watch all these guys, to your point, take over games. And they, have, they don't have a guy on that side of the defense that can do that. So right now, if you're Rob Sala, you have to be more aggressive. If you want the turnovers and you want things to lead the points, you got to start Blitz. shooting your bullets. You got to start blitzing. And hopefully you can do that. Because Patrick Mahomes, if you give him time, he's going to get it. All right, we got more on that game later today and a pick uh, for sure from the guys. Uh, real quick, uh, big uh, noon Saturday, and that means Colorado. Yeah. And Colorado, again, uh, playing uh, the eighth-ranked uh, USC Trojans. And that guy right there, the uh, number one pick in this upcoming NFL draft, unless it's the Cardinals pick, of course, and he stays in school. But Colorado <laughs> is a 22-21 point underdog in this game at home and yet all the celebrities are still buying in to the Deion Sanders mystique and the magic. You got LeBron and Bronny going. I assume they're on the USC side because the kid goes to USC. That's true. You got Jay-Z there. You got Snoop. You got Lil Wayne who's living at every sports fan's dream <laughs> in the last he's on couple a weeks. Tour, pretty much. Being a Green yeah. Man yeah, last Matthew night. McConaughey. I don't know why he's what? there. Why he's, he's, scouting. <laughs> he's scouting for Texas. He's he's a potential, potential playoff implication. So, in any event, it has been a great college football story because it's made a lot of people who ordinarily wouldn't watch certain college games yeah. you know, fall in love with, let's see what happens next with Colorado. The real question for me is this. When USC beats them by 30, um, which they will, don't they just watch. It's that, you know, that's one game. Which, he shouldn't have lost to Bo Nix in Oregon. Oregon put a whooping on. By the way, I think this is a different game Saturday. By the way, they should have lost to TCU. They should have lost to Colorado State. But give them credit, those kids rallied, and they yeah. pulled those victories out, and I give them credit for it. They are going to lose to USC. There's a reason you're a three-touchdown underdog in your own house, because you're not as good as USC. Here's the question. When USC blows them out, are we done? Can we put Colorado to Are we bed? done or the, is the nation done? Is the nation done? Are the celebrities done? Uh, are we done? Can we put that story to bed for a 3-2 and two unranked team, please? It's the prime effect. Do you want to see celebrities on the sidelines watching college football? I love it. I love the fact that Dion is preaching life into this, org, uh, this school and that they look like the biggest, you know, the new kids on the block. The problem is it's how they lose, right? We know they're going to lose. But they I give really, up a lot of points. That I really, I'm really watching the game because I want to see Caleb Williams. Okay. I, I, I like oh, Shadour. You're see Caleb Williams. I like Shadour. I think he's good. I don't know if he's on the level as Caleb, but it's good to see them t- kind of go back and forth. That's the only reason it's, I'm watching the game. See, I, I like the Coach Prime movement. I like the attention that it's garnered. I like the conversation that's built around this. I just don't like that they play Oregon and USC back. Back to back yeah. because it's going it's going to fizzle. 
because you know it's all fun when you have the upset after upset, and then you know over to, like late game heroics at two in the morning <laughs> Eastern. That's all fun. But when you when you watch the Oregon game, that's not fun to watch. No, it and was... this game they're gonna get blown out in this game too, and then we're not gonna be talking about it. Anymore. But both teams don't have a defense now. USC's oh, defense it should be a high, is no, yeah. be a high scoring game. USC's defense is nothing to like yeah. wow over. And by the way, to answer that question at the bottom of the screen, yeah, it ended last week, guys. Like, oh. you know, they, they barely got put points on the board outside of the last drive of the game against Oregon. The, Cinderella lost their but Slipper Boys. But it's not over because you got uh, stars showing up for the game. Why? Because they want to see a because show. Because they're playing a team there's, from there's Los no, Angeles. That's why. No and if I can just ask one other quick question, and they're yelling at me to take a break, so we will. <laughs> and we'll get to the Dallas Cowboys in one second. If you have a premier game, that is going to attract a huge audience, and I'm sure it will. Because You're going to watch it. Uh, I will not watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be in Grinnell, it's Iowa. On it's on Fox. It's on Fox. No, no. Here's the reality, though. Uh, you threw me off I'm my sorry, game right I'm there. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll come up with it at some point. Uh, <laughs> totally forgot. I apologize. Forgot I, I was going to say. Yeah, I'll be in Iowa. Uh, in any event, the Dallas Cowboys look to get off uh, from their bad loss last week against the Arizona Cardinals. Dak Prescott talked about his feelings after losing to Arizona feelings. and how pumped up he is to get back on the field this Sunday against the Patriots right after this. All right, the Dallas Cowboys embarrassed themselves, uh, especially on defense in that red zone offense, and a loss to the Cardinals. So, of course, microphones, find Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott, your thoughts and feelings after embarrassing yourselves against the Arizona Cardinals. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I'm always pissed off after a loss. I don't know if we can rate my different levels of pissed offness. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it sucks. It really does. Um, uh, you don't do anything, you know what I'm saying, with the idea of losing or thinking you're going to lose. And until the, that last second, you know what I mean, it's not really a reality in your head. And so, uh, yeah, we're pissed off. I would disagree with the last part of that. When he threw that bad interception <laughs> yeah, in the end yeah. zone, they're down with 305 yeah. to go, down 12. Yeah. At that point, you kind of know. Kinda oopsie yeah. doopsie. Uh, we're not going to win this game. Uh, look, he, they all got. Look, when you lose a game that you're damn near 10 point favorites in, and you're your world beaters in week one or week two, and you're on that collision course with San Francisco next week is potentially two undefeated teams, arguably two of the best teams maybe in all football. Bop, bop, bop. And then you threw out the egg that they threw out against Arizona. You should be ticked off. I'm not. First of all, I don't care that he's pissed off. I just want to see production. I'd right? be upset if he wasn't ticked off. Well, I would, of course. But at the same time, they didn't play awful. Like, they, they, were, they, they did fairly well. We got, we got the graphic right here to show you. You talk about it. Total 75 plays to Arizona's 53. Talk about time. They beat them in time of possession. 26 for, uh, first downs. Right. 416 yards. And at the end of the day, they lost by 12 because of that pick. But I think overall, they just got to get in the red zone, right? They went week two, they went two for six. Week three, they go one for five. If you're Dak Prescott, they got to call better plays for them, right? And the Arizona Cardinals, give them credit, they schemed them up really good. I'm worried about the defense, right? You let them up 180 yards in the first half, and you look like that when you're supposed to be this daunted defense. Right. And now the recipe is, is out for the to well, beat that Cowboys defense. Pro- the problem wasn't their offense overall. No. Their problem was very specifically their offense inside the 20 yard line. Yes. I mean, we had the stat uh, in that game, they ran 11 plays inside the 10. And, and didn't score but one touchdown. But also, if you're Mike McCarthy, this is on your head, too. Like, you can't come back after this week and say, hey, man, well, we got four blinking lights. You know, we, we lost to the Pats at home. We get penalties, right. red zone. Like, you got to be the answer. And Mike McCarthy, you're the one calling the plays. You got to get Dak in there. It just can't all be on Dak. And this defense has to be a lot better. Yeah, I, mean, you, bottom line. That, I see. I know the question is, is it must win? No, it's not no. must win from the standpoint of them making the playoffs. Yeah, it is must win because you'd be staring down the barrel of being two and three after five. And also, you're playing two. You should have beat the Cardinals. You lose to the Pats. You should beat the Pats. Yes. Now, it answers more questions. Who are the Dallas Cowboys? Right. And that's, that is the big question there because the one thing I think we always say that is accurate, which is good teams beat bad teams. Yes. If you think you're a Super Bowl contender, number one, you don't lose to Arizona. 100%. Number two, you don't follow that up with a loss to the New England Patriots. That's well, for sure. And on top of that, you got the Niners coming down, right? And so when you play the Niners and they see you throw up an egg like that against the, uh, the Cardinals and now possibly lose to the Pats, they're not going to take you serious. They're going to try to cut your throat off from the back and keep uh, it moving. On the other side of the ball, I think it's important to recognize that the Patriots offense has not really shown anything this entire season. Sure. And I really think this is a make-it-or-break-it year for Mac Jones. Like, I really think that they're saying, you know what? 
We're in year three. Year one was pretty good. Year two, not great at all. And I think if this year goes the rest of the year the way it's gone thus far, this is his last year as a starting quarterback for the Patriots. Yeah, Mac Jones ain't that bad, though. I know we not talked good. about him because having that success. He's thrilled. Yeah, the I first mean, two weeks in the first quarter, the first half yeah, of the game. I don't think he's great, obviously, yeah. but he's better than Zach Wilson is. Like Mac Jones, quarterback in the New York Jets. The New York Jets are two and one. Uh, you think so? Yeah, they beat New England. Yeah, like if I swapped quarterbacks, the New York Jets. Zach Wilson's that game. not the bar to get over. Yeah, for like I quarterback in the NFL. You know. it's just, he's just the Jets quarterback. Yeah, but you know, it's he's, like, like, he's like he's like the he's bottom of the barrel. I think he's I probably agree. like the thirtieth best quarterback. He's the Josh the Rosen of the sport. I totally yeah. understand, yeah, like, and I agree with that. He wouldn't make the little Giants team uh, <laughs> right now. But you know, the thing with Mac Jones, it's interesting. New England kind of treats Mac Jones in a similar fashion, some ways, that the Jets are now treating Zach Wilson. There is no heir apparent. Yeah. Like, they cut every other quarterback famously right yeah. before the season started and then only brought you know, Zappi back and guys like that. Now, the difference here is that the Patriots seemingly have no problem at all throwing Mac Jones under the bus. The every Jets time. protect Zach Wilson. The Dallas Cowboys, no problem throwing Dak Prescott under the bus when he's the reason they lose. It's spot on because both, both quarterbacks last year had a rough year, to your point. You talk about uh, Mac, jo- uh, Mac Jones, it was a, it was a bludgeon in it in, in, yeah. in Gillette, man. Like, uh, Billy Zappi came out there, and they were literally chanting his name. They had signs that said, yeah. put Zappi in. Mac Jones was a first-round draft pick, supposed to be the heir apparent to Tom Brady. And we look at Zach Wilson in a different light as, man, we have nobody. Like, this, like we're in a bad, bad place for the New York Jets. But both guys have bumpers, though. Bill O'Brien just seems to be on a better court with uh, Mac Jones. The good news is that Aaron Rodgers uh, did leave his house on crutches, no boot, and he'll be playing by Thanksgiving. So <laughs> okay. We've got that going for us. It Sunday. is Friday. It is time for our favorite day of the week, which is for real or a fugazi. Yes. All right, Willie Colon, here we go. You ready to rock? All right, number one, Jordan Love, Green Bay Packer quarterback, is going to get Matt LaFleur fired. For real? Or a fugazi. Fugazi, man. This is his first year at the helm. He hasn't, he hasn't played a complete game of uh, football. He's a tale of two halves. I think the kid got it. Like, he got beat up last night. Yes, he did. What half was he getting last night? He, 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 one was he, that? He got beat up. I mean, the bottom line is, I think the kid has a bright future. I think he's, he's patient. I love his moxie and poise in the game. He was able to come out at halftime and rally. But, no, he's not going to get looked for a fire. Uh, I say for real. I think he gets <laughs> fire. Yeah, I think he gets the fire. Why not? All right, number. Two. <laughs> Why not? Fire. <laughs> Why not? Number two, two attacking Akimakina Gagalova uh, is a legitimate MVP candidate. For real. Or a fugazi. Yeah, it's hundred percent for real. Anytime you put up four hundred yards uh, of offense on any outfit, it doesn't matter if it's Broncos or not. It's worthy of t- telling the world that you are him. I think Tua has done a fantastic job. You talk about last year, man. Even with his concussion woes, he had twenty-five touchdowns. And we have to start listening to his teammates when they say he is that guy, and he's been able to put it on tape. So I love Tua. It's just a matter of him being consistent. But I think this Sunday is a big game because it's in division against Josh Allen, two worthy quarterbacks. I like. I think it's one. You know, it's pretty much captured the flag uh, of Sunday. If you guys don't mind, put those odds back up real quick. Uh, the uh, current odds to win MVP. No Micah Parsons on that list. Huh? No. <laughs> no, no. no Micah Parsons. Oh, I'm two, looking for it. I that. see quarterback, 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 quarterback. Yeah. Five quarterbacks. I don't see Micah Justin Parsons. Justin Herbert. Sorry, Micah. On that on list. There too. All right, number three. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott should have his number retired by the Cowboys uh, prior to Sunday's game uh, between the Patriots and the Cowboys. For real or Fugazi? I say Fugazi. I mean, at the end of the day, eight years, he had a good span. The problem with Zeke is they gave him a bag. They gave him $15 million to be that guy, and he didn't produce at the level they wanted him to. Right. So they got him out the door. How many playoff wins did they have on, with Ezekiel Elliott? I think they have two. Two. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. good. And I understand I'm good there's a the relationship retired. between him and Dak. They came in together. They're brothers at arms. But Zeke here's was the, Zeke. Well, here's the question. Do you retire the number of your third best blank? If you're the yeah. third best wide receiver, are you getting your number retired? No. If you're the franchise's third best quarterback, are you, with no titles, by the way. If you told me Ezekiel led them to a Super Bowl winner, too. That's the part. Different story. Sure. Uh, that being said, Jerry Jones did say they're going to honor him in some manner. Well, which like, probably happen. means a video and a uh, hug and a car. But I feel like the fan base has to think of you and think of that era 
fondly. You know what I mean? They had to be like, oh, do you remember the Ezekiel Elliott era in Dallas? Well, there's always and that I don't classic, think there was a lot of success. There. What is that classic Christmas game where he jumped in the, you know, the, the little yeah. bowl? Yeah. Yeah. I would like a car. Army bowl. Yeah. Like, if, like if I do a retirement tour, a car. A car. A car is nice. You get, get more than a car. I don't think I'd get more, but I just, a car. An ATV, ben. possibly. What is it? Something that takes what gasoline and has like an engine. I'll take guys. you to dinner. <laughs> what happened? I'll take you to dinner. Nice. That's See? my guy right yeah. there. All right, I like that. All right, Justin Herbert will never win a playoff game with the L.A. Chargers. For real or for Gazy? No, for Gazy. I think it was a big win uh, Sunday against the Vikings. I see this team possibly going on a winning streak. They can score points. Yep. He's a hell of a quarterback. They paid him rightfully so. I think he'll, he has a bright future. He'll win a playoff game. It's a, that defense. Can that defense stop anybody? It's uh, Brandy Staley. He needs to go. If anybody needs to be fired, it's him. If you change that to Brandon Staley, it's for real. But Justin Herbert for Gazy, Brandon Staley for real. Yeah. 100%. It's, it says Justin Herbert. <laughs> I'm just elevating the conversation. I, to the I next got level. you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Staley saved the job with that defensive stand <laughs> against Minnesota last weekend. Uh, real quick, all three undefeated teams, the Niners, the Eagles, and the Dolphins, will lose this weekend. For real or for Gates? No, for Gizzy. I, I think the Niners are legit. I think all three teams are legit. They move on to 4 0. All of them. Dolphins beat the Bills in Buffalo. I got them. Eagles beat Washington. Of course. And the Niners beat the Cardinals. Easy money. Look at that. <laughs> Easy Dolphins money. Are. Easy money. Dolphins. All right, listen. Can I squeeze one more in? Go ahead. I think I got time to squeeze one more in. Zach's not here. Uh, Aaron <laughs> Rodgers. <laughs> Aaron Rodgers will be on the Jets sideline or in the coach's booth this Sunday night. For real? Or I want to see what you're going to say. I'm going to say, I'm gonna say from game. I'm going for real. No. He no. said, he said, you he never doesn't. know who's going to show up at the game. Yes. And at the time, Taylor Swift had not been announced. So you think he's there? Hold on. You think Aaron is coming for Taylor or is he coming Why for Why would he say you never know who's going to show up at the game with that weird sly smile? Yeah. He's Why would he do he's that? He's coming to But you know it's going to be a distraction card. I like You that. know it's going to be every time Zach has a bad play, he's going to be like, what would Aaron no, have no. done? He's going to be in the booth with his arm around Taylor Swift pointing I Kelsey, just like that, he's gonna be like. I, I hate it. I, I hate swear it. to God, stay home. Yeah, I want him there. I want him not in the sideline, but I want him in the booth with a headset on, telling Zach what to do. All right, coming up, a little baseball, and then we get right back to first down football. Justin Jefferson's got something to say, and the Denver Broncos are promising their fans we will get a win this year, but we'll be on Sunday. Find out right after this. Hey, uh, welcome back to the card show. That's David Jacoby. That Hello. big guy right there is Willie Clone. Speaking of baseball, real quick, you know, the Phillies clinched the uh, first wild card spot in the National League. They were playing last night, kind of playing out the string now against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Roll the tape here, boys. Bryce Harper, 1 1 game, uh, 3 2 count. Didn't go around. That's a walk. Uh, no, it's not, because that's Angel Hernandez right there. Oh. <laughs> the worst umpire of all time in the history of Major League Baseball. Bryce Harper yells Get him the out of there. He gets ejected. All right, fans go crazy. Bryce Harper, helmet, crowd, what's up? Now, here's the best part of this. Philadelphia fans have bad hands. They all drop it. It <laughs> lands in the lap of a 10-year-old boy. Oh, that's great. 10-year-old boy gets oh. the batting helmet, and this is amazing. Bryce Harper signs it for him in between innings, and that kid goes home with a story that nobody would believe except he's got the goods to back it up. Yeah, then he lead, he grows up to be the play-by-play -play announcer for the Phillies. <laughs> like, that's how it starts. That's how that whole thing Exactly starts. right. But yeah. great job by Bryce Harper there. And a good job by the Phillies making it back to the playoffs back-to-back uh, -back years now in the National League. Everybody, of course, chasing the Atlanta Braves. We got tons of football. It is Friday, of course. Friday. We know what happened last night. The Detroit Lions went into Lambeau, took care of business against the Green Bay Packers, and now we have first in football and a lot of other football stories that you're going to want to pay attention to this weekend. Starting with the Minnesota Vikings who are 0-3 and, and they have star receiver Justin Jefferson who has lots of jewels and some thoughts about limiting turnovers. I feel like we're playing great ball. Uh, it's just the turnovers that are really killing our drives, killing our momentum. Uh, so I feel like we just need to change that. I feel like we're, once we win that, the turnover battle, I feel like the games will come out differently. Uh, I mean, I'm tired of people saying, you know, we're, we're looking into next season, or, you know, all of the trades and stuff like that. We're, we're focused still on this season. Uh, we have a lot more games to go, and we have a lot more things to accomplish this season. They're focused on this season. They need to limit the turnovers. Is there any chance the Vikings could turn this around? Yeah, I, I, they're the only 0-3 team 
that I think has a chance because this year's been so different than last year in one very particular manner, and that is one-score games. Last year, they set an NFL record. Every win they had was by one score. So that means they were a great fourth-quarter team, and by proxy, they didn't lose the turnover battle in many of those games. Right now, this year, they're dead last. Yeah. They're minus seven in the turnover battle, you know, three games into the season. So he's right. If we don't turn the ball over, worst case, we're 2-1. and one. We might be 3-0 and oh right now. They play Carolina on Sunday, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yep. That is a W. They are going to you get think. a win. Someone's got to win. That is a lock, 100% guarantee. The Minnesota Vikings will beat Carolina in Carolina. I ain't worried about it. Then the question is, two games back, can they make it up? Certainly plenty of football to do it. Yeah, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs, even with the 0-3 invalid. They have the, they can put up points. It's their defense that's got a, that's atrocious. You talk about giving up 200-plus yards and rushing to the Eagles, then turn around giving up 445 passing yards to the Vikings. This is a team that can't stop anybody. And I and I and listen, I give Kevin O'Connell credit. He has started threatening players. I will bench you if we don't figure this out. But at the end of the day, you're 0-3 for a reason. Yes. you got to own it. Kirk Cousins is part of that problem, too. If I'm the Vikings, it's time to start selling. Man. It's time to start breaking well, this team listen, up. Uh, you know, the trade deadline is still three weeks or so away, right? Mid late October. Uh, that being said, as a Jet fan, I hope they lose to yeah. the Panthers. I hope they lose every game because then you have to trade Kirk Cousins because you're not bringing him back. He's lame duck contract wise. So and he's not going to be yeah. the Viking quarterback next year. Plus, you got to worry about Justin Jefferson's contract. That being said, to answer your question, are the Vikings done? I don't think they're done just yet. Now, you lose to Carolina. They're close. Yeah, it's no, a wrap. Yeah. If you beat Carolina, you're one and three, and I know what they'll say in that locker room. You're telling me that we can't beat Green Bay and Detroit straight up and Chicago? I think we can. Their season doesn't end if they beat Carolina. They don't have to win the division. They can get a wild card bid. It's not over for the Vikings, but let's talk about another team, and one of the most exciting rookies in the league is returning. Anthony Richardson is expected to play on Sunday against the Rams. He's fun to watch. What do you expect to see from him against the Rams if he plays? How about we do what America wants us to do? What's third in football? <laughs> oh, third in football. Yeah. Moving yeah. on. Every time <laughs> Russell Wilson opens his mouth, he says something super corny and contrived. And guess what? Yesterday was no different. Russell, he continues to be corny. There's always ups and downs. You know, uh, everybody wants the perfect story, um, but it doesn't make it as good of a story if it's not some challenges along the way. And so um, we're, we're, we're not running from the adversity. You know, we're looking forward to, um, you know, having a great week of practice, going out there, trying to um, play, you know, in a tough environment and trying to get a win. And that's really what matters, and that's what we're focused on. How do you put a positive spin <laughs> after you lose 70 to 20? Well, they're playing the Bears. I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's the only reason they could you lose. Be positive. They could lose. I know they're favored in Chicago by three and a half. I see it on the screen right there. Look, I, that's like dead man talking to me. He is, yeah. uh, it's a wrap to me for Russell Wilson. Uh, he's probably done some damage to his uh, Hall of Fame legacy. He's probably borderline now. Uh, he's not very likable, obviously. He's going to have back-to-back -back embarrassing seasons from a win-loss record, uh, not statistically as well. Uh, but that's – like, people hear that, and they're like, that ain't my dude. No. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. running through fire for that guy right there. And let me just make it very clear. When we learn about success stories, and success stories were built off failure or you know, issues in someone's life or obstacles that people had overcome, we appreciate the success once we learn about it. But in the middle of it, nobody wants to go through no. those bad times. No. We celebrate overcoming bad times once you've accomplished something. Sure. When you're 0-3. The message isn't, this is really good, because nothing good worth having is worth it without a struggle to get it. Said nobody ever, <laughs> right, who had to struggle in life. Ask anybody or any team that struggled. They wish they didn't have to. Sure. And on top of that, if I'm, if I'm the Denver Broncos, their bye week coincides, uh, co coincides with their, um, the trade deadline. I would, I, would, I would get Russell Wilson out of the building. It's I, I, I don't think, want him but at I, that I number. Think, but I think we've seen enough. He's not helping the team, and I don't think he's played awful, so I don't want to put that That's narrative right. out there. But I do think him and Sean Payton are just not getting along. I agree with that. There's, there's, there's blood in the water. I think for him to get his career back, he has to go somewhere else. I think the locker room just tolerates him. I don't think they love him. It's, you know, we talk about certain quarterbacks running over the locker room. I don't think he's done that yet. I don't think he's going to do that. 
I think it's time for him. When the trade deadline comes, you see how big you give him some draft picks and realize, hey, we got Russell to block and move on. I, He's a quarterback I would take if I'm in New York Jets. When, when Aaron Rodgers says, relax, we're going to run the table, like you kind of believe him. Of but course. Russell Wilson sits there with that sly smile on, like smirking and being like, you have to go through adversity in order to win. This is the hero's journey. Everyone's yep. against us. We're going to rally and win. I don't believe him at all. At all. And, and I promise you, Russell Wilson and Sean Payton will not both be part of the Broncos start next season. No, no, but it's easy to say that. And if I own the Broncos, that's the direction I'd go in. But I just gave my head coach a five-year, $90 million contract, so I'm not firing him right away. And by the way, Russell Wilson, and I'm looking it up right here, uh, $17 million next year, $37 million in 2025, $40 million in 2026, $44 million in Ooh. 2027, Ooh. and $50 million oh. in 2028. So I asked you, gentlemen, who's trading for that? So, Nobody. Is how much right. is guaranteed? So here's the only Can choice they got. I didn't know that was that. The only choice they got is they go 0-4. Let's say, let's say they lose to the Bears. And now you're 0-4. And now legitimately the sky is falling. Chicken little's right. everywhere, right? The only thing you can do at that point is you bench them. But let's be honest. I think Jason Sidham is the backup quarterback. Who played well in, in preseason. I mean, yeah. yeah, preseason, preseason. So did Jack Wilson. So did Kenny. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I mean, so they are stuck. Yeah. They are stuck in a spot where Russell Wilson is going to be on that roster for a very long time. And those numbers are real. 5-15, and 15, less than 20 points a game, an under-90 passer rating. All of that stinks. But you gave this guy a contract that you can't escape now. So I think they are both there next year. I can't say Russell Wilson's playing because if I'm Sean Payton, I go to the uh, the Walmart family and I go, look, I know it may not have been you, yep. but here's the deal. I got to go get me a quarterback and you got to let me do it. And I know Russell might be here and that could be a distraction. You can't cut him because the dead cap is ridiculous and you, got, and you can't trade him. So get used to Sean Payton and Russell Wilson in Denver for at least another three or four years. Yeah, but if I'm Sean Payton, you got to figure out how to make it work, especially on the defensive side of the ball. They can't stop anybody. This is they can't, it's not the only out they have is 2026. That's three more seasons. And if they cut him after 2026, they eat $31 million on the cap. Ooh. He is there for the next three years, guys. Get I'm used not to so it. I'm so sure. I think okay. like the NFL contracts are malleable. You can restructure them. You can you can chop the, the money up and pay them somehow. They're going to have to eat a lot of money to get rid of them, but I think it's worth it at this point. Sean Payton's going to go to them and say, I can't start the season with Russell. And they got to get a, like they got the rookie Marvin Mims who's starting to come alive for them, but they need some more pieces of offense. Look, you want to write a big check, pay him out in full to get rid of him? You can do that, but he's getting his money. And ain't nobody else going to give it to him. Yes. Moving on to fourth down and football, overshadowed by a lot of other matchups this Sunday. There's a sneaky good one between the Bengals and the Titans. Joe Burrow is expected to play. What is on the line and what do you expect from Burrow? Uh, first off, I expect the Tennessee Titans to run all over them. Really? Uh, this year. I, I know Henry was a little upset about his you know, production last week and all that stuff. But I do think Tennessee runs and runs successfully against Cincinnati, which is going to be a problem ball control-wise and opportunities for the Cincinnati offense. I know Bengal fans are mad at me again. Why? You know, God forbid I tell the truth. I know you don't want to hear it. And interestingly enough, Bengal fans didn't say a word after two weeks of football when they were 0-2. <laughs> All of a sudden, like cockroaches, you people come out of the woodwork yeah. and have a lot to say when you score 19 points and barely win a game last week. That being said, I think Joe Barr is a walking time bomb. You know, because of this calf. I don't think he's ever going to be 100% until maybe the bye week when he gets two full weeks off his feet and maybe, uh, you know, it heals up a little bit over that two-week span. And I think every time he goes out there, every time, you know, Taylor makes him drop back 49 times in a game, he's at risk of his season ending. And I don't say that because I want it to happen. I don't say it, you know, glibly either. I don't want to see it. I'm a fan of the sport. I want the great players to play because it what gives me the most entertainment and the bang for my buck. But I can't expect an offense that did not throw a touchdown pass again last week, that has not been great in the first two games against divisional opponents, to now show up against an average Tennessee team that will play tough and will play good defense. I can't expect Tennessee to uh, Cincinnati just to roll in there and put a 30-burger on them. Well, no, you, you, you said it earlier in the week. You can't have them throw 
you know, damn near 50 times in that game, especially when they make him an immobile quarterback. They're going to have to figure ways how to get this run game alive. If I'm the Cincinnati Bengals, if you want to continue to roll Joe Burrow out there, protect him with the run game. Now, and think about this. Joe Burrow this year, and we know he's hurt, so this is not a fair representation of what he is as a quarterback because he is great. Yeah. He's completing 55% of his passes. And they're that's all short. because of the calf. Too. They're all short. I agree. He can't that's those... Zach Wilson numbers. Right, 55%. Yeah. That's unacceptable I mean, like for a $275 million quarterback. But there's no reason for it. I, I'm acknowledging There's that. no reason for that. But he's going to go to Tennessee. What does Tennessee do well, albeit not last week? And that's run the football, run right? Yep. What does Cincinnati not do well defensively? That's stop the run. They're third worst in the NFL. We got much more on all that stuff coming up. We got your mid-show headlines. We got the Lions going into Green Bay and doing what one handsome ball guy told you they would do. And that's in <laughs> Paris, the Green Bay Packers. We'll get into it, plus all the big games on Sunday right after this. Good morning. Welcome back to the Carton Show. We have your morning headlines, and you see it right there. The Lions finding the end zone time and time again against the Packers. The Lions beat the Chiefs. The Lions have beat the Packers. The Lions look pretty good. Jared Goff feels good about it. Here's what the quarterback had to say. Yeah, like, like I said, send us anywhere, line us up against anyone, and we feel like we can go in there and beat them. And, and that's a good feeling to have. You know, does it, <laughs> does it always going to happen? I don't know, but we feel like we can. And um, we have that confidence in ourselves and our coaches and each other. And uh, we're, we're working together pretty well right now. Send us anywhere and line us up against anyone after beating the Packers last night. Are they your clear favorites in the NFC North? Yeah, I mean, they are. I think they're the most complete team. And that's such a rare thing for the Lions uh, to feel, what he just said, where we'll play anywhere, line us up against any team in football, and we'll take your best shot. That's a good point. I didn't think of it like that. But you yeah, know why they feel that way? Because yeah. the king of the NFC North is gone, and that's Aaron Rodgers. Correct. But, yo, but listen, someone's still got to take the mantle, right? Sure. Uh, so the, the crown's sitting there, but somebody had to want it. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And obviously they want it, and I think they're, they're the best position to take it. Also, coming off last year's major turnaround and just missing the playoffs and feeling really good about everybody coming back. But like most teams, it starts and ends with your quarterback these yeah. days. And Jared Goff, to his credit, whatever the narrative was, when the Rams decided to send him to Detroit because they needed a better quarterback you know, to win a Super Bowl, which they did mm -hmm. with Matthew Stafford, Jared Goff's career, most people thought at that time, was going to go off a cliff, and that's a wrap. He made a lot of money. Yep. Jared Goff's an afterthought. To his credit, he embraced being the man in Detroit. He is the leader in that locker room, and he's playing great football, not good football, not good football, which is why I had them in my top four where we uh, busted out the mountain earlier this week. You know, good teams, we see this frequently, namely with the Philadelphia Eagles. You jump on an opponent. You, you end the game before halftime. I know Green Bay made a run in the second half, and I respect yeah. that. Yeah. This game was over at halftime. Yes. It was over in the first quarter. Right? And that's not just the Detroit offense. That's a defense now that also gets a lot of pressure on the opposing quarterback. And think of this just for a second. If you go back a couple weeks, I know not everyone nationally got to watch this game in your local markets and all that stuff. Go back and watch the Seahawks. film or read the story of their loss in overtime to the Seattle yeah. Seahawks. Yep, yep. You are a couple plays away Correct. from the Detroit Lions being 4-0. And being talked about the way we talk about San Francisco and Philadelphia, right? Yep. They are real, and they are going to win that division. The only thing I struggled to, when I was watching this game is the is the Packers' defense that bad, or is the Detroit Lions' offense that good? Because they gave up 211 yards in the first half, and they couldn't get off the field on third down. And every time they couldn't get off the field on third down, led to a touchdown. So I'm like, mm, is it Jared Goff really that guy? Which right. they look like. They look like an efficient offense. And they and listen. Jordan Love wasn't protected last night. He got beat up early. I love his strength and his grit. But overall, the Packers have a problem up front. They don't get David, Bakhtiari, David Bakhtiari back in the lineup and Elton Jenkins. This is going to be the tail of the tape for the uh, Green Bay Packers. Jordan Love is going to be running for his life, and it's going to be ugly games, and hopefully he can come back in the second half. And I, I just want to say this on behalf of the Lions fan base. I love it. Yo, know, it's great to see a team and a franchise that for 20, 30 years have been like in the lower rung of the NFL year after year after year suddenly having success and last night against a team that's been the mere opposite nothing but success over the last 20 years and i can relate to I, that i, I knew I, I, I just go to
coming. So my family's coming. I knew it was coming around. I go to Detroit a few times a year, and I'm in a cab in Detroit before the season starts. And the cab driver's like, listen, week one against the Chiefs is going to be tough, but after that, we are cruising. <laughs> and no one's felt like that in that yeah. city for so long. And as Jets fans, with the hope you had with Aaron Rodgers, you can understand that, like, this is real. Yeah. They're looking at their division being like, it's ours. We're it's the ours, class right. of the yeah. division now, right now. I want to just go into the numbers real quick. There's a play last night that no one's going to talk about because the Lions held on and won the game by double digits. So you, if you didn't watch it, you won't think about it. But end of the third quarter, all right, show this play right here to read. Huge play. All right, so you have your clock's ticking down. Tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. That clock's at zero. Zero. That clock is still at zero. That clock is on zero. And after it hits zero, uh, they snap the ball. You know, deep pass down the right side, then completed, tackled the on the eight. All right. That set them up for a score. Now, that yeah. set them up for a score. Yeah. By the way, that leads to a two-point conversion attempt, which they don't get. If they make that two-point conversion. Like that. By inches. Now it's a one-score game. Stiff and all Jordan of a sudden, Lewis. the crowd's going crazy. The Lions maybe panic a little bit. And Green Bay, like last week, maybe they steal a W. What I'm trying to figure out, guys, because I don't know these things, when the clock hits zero, yeah. and I'm not talking about the play clock where they give you like a millisecond to snap it on zero, I'm talking about the play clock. <laughs> when the play clock hits zero, and it's still at zero, a solid second and a half later, isn't somebody supposed to blow their whistle and well, say the third quarter yeah. is over? Really, really, let me take this because you're too busy playing professional football. Yeah. I'm a professional, professional football watcher. Yes. And watching that moment, it was so awkward and abnormal because when it goes to zeros, I'm so used to the ref running on the field. You hear the whistle and you're waiting for it and waiting for it and waiting for it. And they snap the ball. And I'm still thinking they're going to blow this dead. There's yeah. no way they're going to allow Look, this to happen. It's, a, it, it's one, it's, zero. But it's, it sits at this number. Yeah. for a full two seconds. It was so long. I was ready off. to take some Ozempic. <laughs> <laughs> but you know why, right? Look at the score right now, 27 to 11. Yeah. If they don't convert that, that's boring football for Thursday night. Oh. The NFL, oh, the oh. the oh. NFL oh. is not going to allow the green, the historic <laughs> Green Bay Packers get blown out at home uh -huh. by the oh. Detroit Lions. And we're also going to move on, but there was you, something happening in Lambeau. There were some boobs. Ooh, there were exactly. booze in Lambeau. Yeah. And I was like, and then and the announcer said, it's like, when was the last time they were booing the offense in oh, Lambeau it's, Field? It's, it's and you time. know Goodell was just like, yeah, let's kill us. Yeah. Hey, let's, 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 let's get this going. Yeah, right. let's get this going. Right. Moving on to our next headline, a huge game, the biggest game of the weekend is in Buffalo between the undefeated Dolphins and the Bills, and Stefan Diggs knows just how big this game is, and he explains why. Let's listen. And for us, like, it's always like a, it's a division game. You know, they say they only count as one, but they kind of count as two, especially if you win the first one. You know, last year they beat us the first time, um, lost a couple to a couple teams in our division the first time. And it's just like, you, say, you learn a lot from those losses. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's a big game each and every game, but I look at it as, and, you know, this is the same team that we play. They're good. That's a good football team. Now, forget the AFC East. Yeah. The Chiefs look pretty vulnerable. Does the winner of this game become the favorite in the AFC? No. no. I don't know about the, the – no. I would no. say no to that because, you know, Kansas City still exists. It looks like they got their mojo back. But they're amongst the class teams of the AFC. But I would, I would go further than that. You can lose this game and still be in that conversation. Yep. These are two of the better teams uh, in the entire uh, conference. I don't think anyone would argue with me with that. And when you consider other teams that we had expectations of getting out of the gate quickly, teams like Jacksonville, for example, Bengals, uh, it hasn't Ravens. happened. You know, Greg yeah. Jennings, Broncos, obviously. Yeah. Ravens. <laughs> you know, like Bengals? The, re the reality. I Greg Jennings, yeah. Broncos. Jets, even though they, we, we thought, I thought the <laughs> AFC was seven or eight teams deep, but it yeah. does feel like it's about three. I do think the winner of this game at least, you know, takes a small step forward towards uh, control of at least the division title. I'll give you that. Uh, but I think both of these teams are going to be standing in early January and playing postseason football, uh, regardless of which one of them wins the division. Right now, obviously, you have to lean towards Miami. They haven't lost yet. Their offense is doing historic things. Uh, but I'm telling you right now, Buffalo is still a very, very good football team. And what I saw the last two weeks was a quarterback and a team that very quickly whitewashed the stink of their loss to the New York Jets.
uh, and they are playing very good football. And I'm excited to watch this game because I think this has the markings of week one Dolphins Chargers where it comes down to the last possession and it is a high scoring game. Well, it, this Sunday is going to be blockbuster football just for the simple fact that the Miami Dolphins are finally going to face a real defense. They haven't thus far. You know what I mean? The Broncos suck. You talk about the Chargers, they suck. But this is this is closer than you think. Look at the Dolphins offense averaging 43.3 points a game. And you talk about the Bills defense, uh, yards per, per, per allowance, excuse me. So now you're talking about the Bills defense there. They're, they're shutting people down, 11 points a game compared to the uh, Like the best the offense versus the yeah, best defense. Pretty good, much, yeah. right. And so when you look at this right now, this is going to be a tight one. I don't think it's going to be a shootout. I think it's going to be a gritty AFC East matchup. I would just say I, I, the Bills defensive rankings there, to me, are a tad overrated. Uh, because they played the New York Jets and Zach Wilson, mm -hmm. and they played the Washington Commanders and, the and Sam Howell. Right. And, the and they played the Raiders, pardon yeah. me, right. It ain't like they just went through, you know, Herbert, <laughs> Mahomes, yeah, yeah, and a healthy yeah. Joe Burrow. Yeah, yeah. Right? They went through three of the worst offenses uh, in the NFL right now. So this will be a big test for them, too. I'm looking forward to it. That's going to be a very entertaining game. It's an early game, 1 o'clock, in Buffalo. And again, you have an undefeated team playing as an underdog which does not happen a lot week four and on, and that's the scenario in Buffalo. Next headline, another big game is obviously the Cowboys against the Patriots. Patriots going into Dallas. The Cowboys coming off a loss against the Cardinals. What do the Patriots need to do? What needs to happen for them to pull off this upset? Uh, stay on the bus. Uh, they can't beat they the, the team. They can't beat the team. They can't, they they can't, can't beat them. They just lost to the Cardinals. What are you talking about? That's a Belichick. Like, this is going to be a beatdown. They cannot beat the Dallas oh, Cowboys. Never underestimate Jack uh, Prescott's ability to turn the ball. Yeah, but this is uh, I agree with you on that. But this is, a, this is a tough spot for a lot of Number one, you're coming off a win. Uh, they're coming off an embarrassing loss. It's in their building. You are not a very good team offensively. They are a very good team defensively, right? So where are the Patriots points going to be coming from? I think six and a half is, is easy uh, and should be a lot higher than that. I think the Dallas Cowboys run away with this game. I don't even think it's competitive. Yeah, I disagree, Craig. I think the one thing the Patriots do well is run the football, and they're going to be doing it right after that Dallas offensive, uh, excuse me, defensive line that gave up so many points in the first, uh, first half to the Cardinals. So I think if you're the Dallas Cowboys, yeah, you got to get in the red zone, but you also have to beat them in dramatic fashion if you want to get back to being the contenders, if yeah. you will. You cannot allow the New England Patriots to come here and it is, you only win by a field goal, so to speak. I think optics matter, and we're going to see, but I think the Patriots keep it close. Yeah, there's. I'm interested in seeing – Micah Parsons is already the best defensive player in football. This week, of course, there was the uh, press conference where Bill Belichick was asked, well, is he as good as Lawrence Taylor? And we went through that yesterday. Yeah. No, nobody's as good as Lawrence Taylor, at linebacker. But from what we've read and heard out of his own mouth this year in Micah Parsons, he's on a personal mission. He wants to be the MVP of the league, yep. and he wants to be the best defensive player in all of football. And he wants to win and, a Super Bowl by himself. And he wants to win a Super Bowl by himself, 11-on-1, <laughs> on one, right? But... This week, the notion's been the guy on the other sideline publicly said, yeah, you're good, but you ain't that good. Yeah. I like, can't wait to see Micah Parsons try to disrupt this game and dominate and get a few sacks and cause a couple turnovers and then ask Bill Belichick, how good am I now? So in order for the Patriots to win this, I don't think they're going to dominate on both sides of the ball, but what they need is they need turnovers from Dak Prescott. So – that's something that we've been focused on a lot in the preseason. Yeah. Here at the Cardinals. Well, he threw a lot. He threw a lot of picks. So we've got a whole thing set up now. Oh. We've got Dak Prescott turnover chain. So Ooh. I'm gonna go get Dak, and you explain what's happening. Yeah. So look, uh, Dak Prescott, of course, led the league in uh, interceptions uh, last <laughs> year, and uh, he led the league in interceptions uh, at OTAs and in minicamp this year. Oh, there so there we go. This is Dak Prescott, everybody. Welcome to hey, the show, Dak. Dak. Great to have you here. So we thought to honor Dak Prescott's career accomplishments of leading the league in interceptions last year and leading the summer while missing in five interceptions, games. all right, while missing five <laughs> yeah. games, we have created the Dak Prescott interception Ooh. chain. Woo. All right, yes. now you see a lot of teams, University of Miami started this, where after a big interception, you rock the fumbles, goal. Fumbles too. All right, fumbles too. Last week, Dak Prescott through his very first interception. Hey. Good one too. There you go, kiddo. There you go. Beautiful. Right. So, every single time Dak Prescott throws an interception, we will adorn him with another interception <laughs> chain. Look at this one. All this right? is a great hey. way to start. 
third, you're like triple coverage in the end zone, down 12-3 weeks ago. Can, can you trust your quarterback? Yeah. No, tough. just you cannot. I love watching this play because imagine two of the Cardinals defenders weren't there. Pick any two. It's still an interception. Well, on top of yeah. that, it's a yeah. sea yeah. of red. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's like one that was one of those. Jersey. All right, guys, listen, here's the play, but I'm only throwing the ball <laughs> to you. If That's that it. was actually Dak Prescott, he would throw me the football because of the color of my sweater. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> he would. He would. exactly right. So, listen, now Dak Prescott can make this a waste of money and a waste of a bit because if he doesn't throw interceptions, we have no reason to bring him out again. But he threw one last week, and every single time he throws a pick, we give him another chain to rock as the interception king of the NFL. Do you think he throws one Sunday? Oh, he'll be. He may throw two. I would ones. say he this, considering the expense of building this. <laughs> yeah. I don't he care better. if they win by yeah. thirty. Yeah. He better throw a pick. We, we might not be back right. if he doesn't throw a pick. He got no shoes for me. Yeah. Moving on to our final headline and another big game in a, in a whole slate of big games. This one's been between the Ravens and the Browns. And in advance of this division rivalry matchup, linebacker for the Ravens, Roquan Smith, said something that shocked me. Let's listen to it. Another man's house and you're trying to take over. Like, his wife, kids, everyone there to watch them. So, you we going over to beat their tails in front of their <laughs> wife and kids. So, when you think about it from that perspective, like, any man's going to, you know, fight to the death from that point. I know if that's me in that case, I know I would. He said this yesterday morning. Yeah. So now that that sound has gotten into the Browns locker room. Yeah. And how does how does that spread and how is that accepted? It turns into like a WWE matchup, right? It's like, when I come to your town, brother, when the Ravens show up, <laughs> we're beating your kids and we're smacking your wife, brother. It's that type of talk. I love it. And, but you also got to understand one thing. The Ravens not only play the Browns, they got the Steelers coming up, yep. and they got the Titans in London. So he's really getting his team riled up and ready to, like, hey, man, this ain't the only only fight we got ahead of us. We got to rally. We got to come with the big bad boy mentality. And I love it. Now, some people may take offense to it, but this is AFC North football. It's trash talking and we get busy. See, I love the two, but I don't know. I don't think I'm going to be offended by it. He didn't say I'm coming to, you know, take your wife and do bad things to her <laughs> and spike your children in their sleep. I mean, he aggressive. said, this is the mentality. Yeah. He goes, and I'm sure they're prepared for it. So we love it. Yeah. But I don't think anyone in Cleveland's like, I can't believe you just said that. You know, we had to put that up on a bullet. <laughs> we're, we're in a soft culture, right? Everything's right. yeah. like, yeah, you can't but say this, can't say that. Here's what's what crazy. And uh, I'm glad you, you put this in, uh, in first in football because, yeah, we talked a lot about, or headlines, pardon me, uh, your Bills, Dolphins, huge game. This is a huge game. Yes. yes. You're yeah. talking about one of the toughest divisions in football, blood in the water because of the Burrow injury and the fact that he's not right. And these two teams right now are sitting there going, all right, you're two and one. I'm two and one. It's a battle for supremacy. And this is a franchise in Cleveland that has rarely in a long time been in this spot where A, you got to take them seriously, and B, from a defensive standpoint, Forget about the Jets defense. The Cleveland Browns are money good. Oh, they one, might be the best. One they might be the mean, best defense. They first dominate. Third category. Look at it. Look that, at that is called being the best defense in football. Yeah, the number one. When you're first in those categories, those aren't Fugazi categories. They're like expected, right. evaluated, you know, whatever. Three whatever. games they've played. They've yeah. given up 30 yeah. points in three games. Think about how many teams gave it up in one week already this season. So well, I'm really interested in watching this game. And it sucks to me I only have one TV, so I'm going to have to, like, red zone it or something yep. to even see highlights this as it's happening. This is as intriguing a game as the Buffalo-Miami game. Yes. The only difference is that, you know, neither one of these teams come in having scored 70 points last week and are sitting at 3-0. and But this is a major battle, and I would say this. The Baltimore Ravens offense has not looked great yet. They lose their starting running back. Odell Beckham's probably not playing here because of the ankle oh, half injury. Half offensive starters. Right. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you've got a team that was supposed to be built on speed and high power capabilities with Todd Monkey calling the plays, and we have not seen it yet. They're still 2-1, and one, but the Cleveland Browns defense is good enough to throttle them. We talk about Micah Parsons so much, and then we talk about T.J. Watt, and we talk about Bosa brothers. You need to focus on Miles Garrett because I would say what he has done is, oh is step in step with every other one of those defensive players, the impact that he has on the game. You could say that he's the best player on the best defense, therefore he's the MVP. You could. Not Micah Parsons. And you quickly, could. this is a statement game from Lamar Jackson because they gave you this money. They gave you this money to beat this defense yeah. and to be that guy in this game. So we'll see. Yeah, now, the only caveat I'll give you is that, and I, I usually don't go this 
way because I'm not mature enough to. But, you know, new offense, new offensive coordinator, it doesn't just click day one. They will get better as the season goes along. But this is a good kind of barometer. You know, at the four-week poll, who are we and what are we? And I think both teams will have a big answer on that coming up uh, after this game. And I'm excited to see it. Real quick, though, low scoring – or will there be points to that game? Oh, this is this is a gritty 10-3 to 3 type. Yeah, yeah. Is this, yeah, this is not going to be the high Low scoring at all. Uh, we got much more coming up on this Football Friday. We have an Aaron Rodgers sighting. We've got words from the defensive coordinator of the Kansas City Chiefs, which are nothing but flat-out lies. <laughs> and we will let you hear those lies right after this. Looks like Christmas came early, Jet fans. What's up, Aaron Rodgers? Yes! Yeah. Look at him there. Woo! Where's the boot? All right. yeah. Put the boot on. That's a guy with a torn Achilles, not wearing a walking boot, not wearing socks either for that matter, okay. wearing a sleeve on the, uh, on the calf, and that means that rehab and recovery are going great. And he's going to be back on the field before the end of this season. Forget about next season. The savior is returning yet again. Yes. Do you honestly believe he'll be back? What happened? Do you believe he'll be back? Like the Jets, I mean, they can, they're not, they're not going to the playoffs. What, what happened to I'm you? Just, I'm just, I'm what sick. happened to you? I'm huh? sick. I got a cold. What are you doing? Storing that mouth <laughs> yeah, cancer out of people yeah. is what you're doing right there. I'm just saying. So can I enjoy the fact that rather than sitting in a hospital bed with his I'd leg up. I'd rather see him in a boot. A leg up on a stack of pillows. Got, oh, 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 oh. My man decided. He goes, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. I'm coming back quick. And I, that's some evidence of it. Take, Guy went for a Starbucks run with a torn <laughs> Achilles. Take I this love picture it. of me in the parking garage. Take this picture of me in the parking garage and send it to yeah, every who took that picture, by the way? Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, what billionaire's daughter took that picture? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Mallory, I love you, baby. Uh, anyway, that, that is good news that uh, Aaron Rodgers is out and about. Yeah. And if he's able to do that, then the rehab's got to be going well. And that's a great gift for us Jet fans who thought that uh, the Grinch had stolen Christmas yet again. Speaking of the Jets, obviously they play the Kansas City Chiefs. A memo to all you Taylor Swift fans, you're not going to hear her perform. I'm not sure why you're buying tickets to this game, but by all means, come in and wear green and root for the New York Jets. Chiefs defensive coordinator Steve Spagnuolo uh, cautioned everybody that just because we're the Chiefs and they're the Jets doesn't mean we just show up and win because anybody can beat anybody. Right, Steve? Play the audio. Anybody in this league can beat anybody. Any unit can make another unit look bad. I mean, all you got to do is look around the league and see what happened in some of the games this past week, and the expectations are for this team to do that, and it doesn't happen because they're pros too. They're, I mean, they're in the NFL play. I'm talking about the offensive players for the Jets because they're all good players. Boy, I tell you, that is a seasoned coach who doesn't want anything to come out of his mouth that the New York Jets can put on a bulletin board or the talk shows in New York can use to rally the guys. That being said, he ain't right. He's lying to you. If you think the Kansas City Chiefs are worried about the New York Jets, you're crazy. No, but what games is he referring to? He's referring to the Arizona Arizona Cardinals. Cardinals, Yeah, that's what he's talking about. Yeah, Yeah. but that was that that was played well. They just couldn't get in the red zone. It wasn't like a landslide whooping. But when you're a ten point favorite and everyone thinks you're gonna blow a team out and you're waiting for the San Fran game coming up in a couple weeks and you go there and you lose by double digits, which is what they did. But I also think that's what he's talking about. He's full of it. His linebacker, Willie Gay, couldn't even answer the question yesterday. He's He's laughing. He's stumbling. He said, what did you see from Zach Wilson? He goes, that's a hard question. Yeah, yeah. because there's a difference between players and coaches. Yes. Players are far more honest than coaches are. Willie Gay kept it real. He didn't want to be embarrassing or insulting to sure. the Jets. He's like, I can't answer that because to me it looks like they're panicking. <laughs> you know, I'm just telling you what it looks like. But what do you think Steve uh, Spag- Steve Spag- Spagnola is licking his chops like I lick my fingers after a good family bucket of chicken. Yeah. Uh, he can't wait for this game because he knows what we all know. You put a little teeny bit of pressure on Zach Wilson and that below average offensive line right now, and it is a wrap. They played scrappy last week. I don't, I don't, I don't dump them out too fast. But I do say this if you're the Jets' offense, what do you have left? Throw the kitchen sink at the Well, now the you and I are in lockstep yes. on that. You don't hold any back. Throw right. it. Whatever you've been holding, throw it at. And by the way, from a play calling standpoint, too, not just from Zach Wilson, you know, maybe throwing the ball deep as opposed to always checking down and checking down. The season's not over yet. 
you know, we expect them to lose this game and go to one and three, and then we could talk about the Jets' season maybe being over at that point. I'm happy to have that conversation. It's not over just yet, but I'm with you. Yeah. From a play-calling standpoint, look, I want this kid running around. I want him throwing the ball down the field. I want flea flickers. I want double reverses. I want to be creative. I want to catch Kansas City maybe a little lazy, maybe a little off guard, and I want to throw stuff at them that they're not expecting. I'll give you an example. Here's what they're expecting. Run, run, pass, (laughs) punt. That's what they're expecting. (laughs) That's the New York Jet offense. I would come out. Shotgun offense, no huddle, pop, 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 throw in the football because they're not getting ready for that. And then I can mix the run into it. And by the way, question for the New York Jets. You gave Dalvin Cook $8 million to help Brees Hall out and be a one-two punch combination like you had way back in the day uh, it, during the Rex Ryan era, right? LT, well, you, right. Agree. Yep. So to me... Why are we using those guys? And that doesn't mean, you know, off-body tackle left, off-tackle right. That means you have two weapons. Use them. Throw them the football out of the backfield. Run sweeps. Yeah. You know, something. Because if you're not going to do it, you're wasting $8 million. Dalvin Cook was such a great playmaker in the passing game in Minnesota. And I have not seen that at all from the Jets so far in these three games. Jacoby, I don't think he's been on the field for more than 10 plays in a, in a game this year. Yeah, and it makes me question, what was he doing? I know he was recovering from the shoulder surgery in the summer. But at the same time, you expect him to be in shape. Like, he was really uh, ambitious and focused on trying to get to Miami. That didn't happen. But at the same time, when he signed to the Jets, he was like, oh, watch out now. We're going to get the Dalvin Cook of old. And we haven't seen a glimpse of it. No, which, uh, you know, I'm very close to the Jets. Maybe I'm too close to the Jets. Maybe you're too close to the Jets. Jacoby, you don't even like the Jets. Not at all. And I do know that you consider yourself a bit of a foodie. Uh, Would you like to put together, as an objective objective. observer, a recipe for the Jets to beat Kansas City? There's a recipe for the Jets to pull off this upset. It is not for... Or inexperienced chefs, okay? <laughs> you need to have a lot of time in the kitchen in order to pull this off, but here are the ingredients that are needed in order to beat the Chiefs if you are the Jets. Number one, you need to start with four quarters of a dominant Jets defense. We're talking about the defense that we thought we were going to get from the Jets, not the defense we've seen weeks one through three. Next thing we need, one successful Jets fake punt. As you guys said, <laughs> let me see a flea flicker. Let me see an onside kick. Trump. Let me see a Trump. fake punt. You need to throw everything you can at the Chiefs. One the next thing you need to put in the pot, Two Mahomes trying too hard interceptions. We've all seen him do this. Throw it with his left hand, throw it behind the back, just throw it into double coverage. He does this sometimes. He's going to need to do it at least twice in this game. And then finally, we need 80,000 people turning on Taylor Swift. We need this (laughs) whole thing to be the opposite of her experience last week. And then we need to let that simmer for three hours under low heat, stir occasionally with constant prayer. And then you're going to get the results (laughs) of... A Jets upset. Prayer might be the only thing I want to use. And it's going to be 17 to 13. If these things happen, you will have the delicious meal that is a Jets victory. Yeah, the Taylor Swift thing um, uh, I, annoys me and aggravates me. Uh, and here, be, oh, be, it annoys me too. And here's because I can't, I'm trying to figure this out. No joke, the secondary ticketing market exploded yesterday when word got out that Taylor Swift is going to be at the game uh, to watch you know, Travis Kelsey and the Kansas City Chiefs uh, try to beat the Jets on Sunday night. All of a sudden, all of her fans, and obviously they, the Swifties. there are millions of them, yeah. right, are now buying tickets at record rates. The ticket prices went through the roof because she's going to physically be in attendance She's not singing. She's not performing. She's not going to be on the sideline. She's going to be in a luxury box with the rest of the, you know, the chief's wives or girlfriends or families. And you're not even going to see her. But the power of her fan base is extraordinary. And I'm getting a little tired of it. <laughs> what, what, what bothers me about the whole thing is I think that she's using the shield. She's using the, the popularity of the NFL to advance her own She doesn't need the, the shield. And I'll give you a good example. Is. And this is the one thought, and then we'll end it on this thought, okay? This is why my mind is a little crazy right now. She said no to performing at the Super Bowl halftime show. They asked her. Of this year? All right. I think it was this year, yeah. And she declined the invitation to go to the Super Bowl and perform at halftime. 
but she said yes to spending three hours at MetLife Stadium watching Zach Wilson play football. She's supporting her man. <laughs> I, I'm not mad at it. I it like just it. shows you the like, split the effect. No to the Super Bowl. Yes to watching <laughs> Zach Wilson play quarterback. What? It's going to be the biggest upset. Doesn't of the make year. any sense. <laughs> it's be the biggest upset of the year. So you got to believe, be Craig. I, I, we're, the segment's not over yet. We're going extra long on this segment. Yes. Because great. it's our Friday segment that Jacoby hosts called Ovas and Unders. Oh. Simple over and unders this week. And we start with the number of teams that will be undefeated after week four. There are three undefeated teams over under 2.5. Will all three teams stay undefeated? Of course, I am talking about the Niners, the Eagles, and the Dolphins. Niners, uh, what's the over-under? 2.5. Okay. Will all three stay undefeated? We start with Mr. Carton. What do you got? Over. Yeah, there teams. you go. Over. I think, uh, oh, the Dolphins. No, under. Oh, under, there you under. go. My I'm bad. going over. <laughs> I like it. Bills beat the Dolphins. <laughs> Sorry. I forgot how the game goes. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. Let me just get my official answer there. I forgot about it. Miami. I think the Bills win. Yes. I think San Francisco beats Arizona. And I do think, uh, was it Philly? Philly. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, Philly beats Washington. But I do think the Bills hang on and beat the Dolphins. So I think there are two undefeated teams after this week. No, no. I got the Dolphins winning in dramatic fashion. That defense valid there, a good one. I think two and everything they put, bring together. They're, they're going to throw the kitchen sink at the Bills. I'm not worried about that. All right. Remember, we've got a mannequin and we've bunch but made a bunch of chains okay number of interceptions Dak Prescott that throws right. against the Patriots the over under is 1.5 will Dak Prescott have two or more interceptions against the Patriots? all right well for the sake of the bit that we spent a lot of money all on right, the chains that Parker. we bought yep I'm going over chains aren't cheap. I'm going over I think we get two picks out of that New England defense, one of them by Matthew Judon, and he takes it back to the house oh, for six. Oh, a pick six from yeah, Judon. Yeah, we get a pick six, yeah. Yeah, I'm going under. Uh, Dak threw a lot last week, and I don't see that happening. I think they're going to lean on the run game. They're going to make an example that they don't need Zeke Elliott. They have Tony Pollard, so they're going to run it down the Patriots' throat. Now, gonna, it's going it's to be weird, though. If they do like a real over the top Dallas style uh, celebration God. of Elliott's cowboy career, right? I, I'm, I'm actually interested in seeing what they do for him either at halftime or before. But the what end. can they do? They'll tie the jersey, I guess. Play a video, give him a standing O, and give then him a pickup truck. Yeah. <laughs> if you give him a pickup truck, give him some boots yeah. and a cowboy hat. Right, remember, I can use a pickup truck. Yeah, Ravens linebacker Roquan uh, Smith said yeah. that the Ravens are going to beat the Browns in front of their wife and kids in Cleveland. When you say it like that, yeah. so <laughs> so number, number of personal fouls committed on Roquan Smith over under 2.5. At him specifically. Yes. I'm sorry to be difficult here. Fouls that he commits, no, commits or guys yeah, hurting him. him. Trying to hurt him. So they're coming for him. He has they're a target on his back. They're coming for him. Uh, yeah. um, all right. All right. All right. All right. All right. I'm saying under. Yeah. Because as Willie correctly pointed out earlier in the show, dudes have gotten soft these days. Uh -huh. Oh, Words no, words hurt, man. Words hurt. <laughs> but people fight words with words now. Uh, plus, I don't think you're going to risk trying to win the game by taking out his ankle or his knee. So I say under. Yeah, I'm going under, too. I don't think anybody on that Browns defense, uh, on the offensive side, excuse me, is, is about that life. So I'm, I'm going under. I think Roquan. And plus, this is motivation for that defense. They're going to be fired up. They're going to back his words up. I think it's going to be a gritty AFC North so this one's an actual over/under, the an actual traditional over/under. Bills Dolphins over/under 53.5 points. Ooh. 53. This is why I asked this one because it's a good one. It's a good is one. Is this the actual over/under? The actual over/under. Yep. All right. 53.5 going... points. Do you expect the Dolphins Bills to be a high-scoring game? You want to go first? No, you go. All uh, right. Over. No. Over. Ooh. I think it's a high-scoring game because that's what Miami does. And while I do respect the Bills defense will be the best defense they've probably played against thus far this year. And you can't look at last week's game as a barometer of exactly how good that offense is because you know, they put 70 points against a team that just didn't try or want to tackle. 53 and a half tells me it's going to be a high-scoring game, and I would take the over. Yeah, I'm going under. But I also, I'm also saying that they're going to score, what, 21, 28 points? So that is not conducive to what they've been averaging, which is 40 points. And I think this is on Sean McDormand. You know the bullies coming. How yeah. are you going to defend your house? Yeah, so I think, I think have it's going to be a lot like their first game of the year against the Chargers, where I think the Bills are very capable of putting 30 on the board. Yes. Yep. Uh, like, yes. you know, very few teams can. And I know their defense is better, obviously, than the Broncos' defense and then the Chargers' yep. defense. But I think Miami's offense is yet to be stopped. 
They're going to score points. Weather ain't a factor. It's going to be beautiful in Buffalo uh, on Sunday. It's not going to be raining and snowing and all that crap, right? Uh, and I think you're looking at a shootout. I agree. I, yeah, and I think the Bills win that shootout. But I think it's going to be low scoring for the Dolphins, which may be 28 points. Less than 50. <laughs> Less than 50, right. Yeah, so it's like 31 28, that's over. Uh, I'm with yeah, I'm Craig. I think true. it's going to be a high scoring, close game that the Bills win. Finally, one last one. Yeah. Number of Taylor Swift mentions during the oh, Jets Chiefs game. We've talked about it enough over, for the show. Not, over under 7,926. No. <laughs> yeah. You can't quit, Craig. Boy, over under 7,926 mentions. Yeah, Taylor over. Swift I'm boycotting. Uh, I talked about it. I'm done with it. It makes no sense. To me, I don't care. If you told me she's playing at halftime, I've got some interest in it. What if I, I like she's playing songs. quarterback for the Jets? It'd be an upgrade. <laughs> all right. Yeah. And then I would appreciate all the conversation about Taylor Swift, but I cannot yeah. do it. I won't do it. Get that board Big out of over here. There. We're done. Big it's only personal, Taylor. I'm sure off. you're a great it's, girl. It's supposed to be Taylor, but I yeah. couldn't uh, get the all right. long In any event, <laughs> coming up, uh, Ezekiel Elliott <laughs> makes his triumphant return to Dallas, and they've got something special special plan for him, but is he good enough to send the Cowboys packing for the second week in a row? We got Dallas to England right after this. Hey, real quick, before we get to first of football, there's something happening for the first time ever in the history of the NFL this Sunday. Never before has a team that won by 50 been an underdog the next week and the team that lost by 50 been a favorite the next week. Well, that's happening right now. After the 70-20 to 20 loss uh, to the Miami Dolphins, the Denver Broncos are favored on the road against the lowly Chicago Bears by three and a half points. And the Dolphins, who dropped that 70-burger on the faces of... Uh, the Denver Broncos are in Buffalo and they're underdogs in the history of the NFL. That has never, ever happened before. Disrespect to Miami or disrespect to Chicago? No, I think this is Dolphins way for disrespect. What they've done this far has been revolutionary. You talk about the motions, you talk about McDaniels, you talk about Tua coming into life and emerging. If I'm the Dolphins, this is personal, especially if you get to do it in their home uh, It also home tells field. you how good Buffalo is. That's yes. why everyone's sleeping on Buffalo. Again, because the Jets beat them. But if you sleep on Buffalo, you're going to wake up with a black eye. It's, it's one of those things where it, it makes no sense. The team that won by 50 is an underdog. The team yep. that lost by 50 is favorite. However, I think that's how it's going to play out. I, yeah. think, I think the Dolphins lose and the Broncos win. But if, if you've been paying attention to the Dolphins, they, they're must-see TV. Yep. We watched yeah. the Bills on Monday night lose to an Aaron rodgers New York Jets team. So right. half the nation is like, ugh. Okay, we'll see him when we see him. <laughs> you know, it's just like that again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see him when we see him. All right, you sound like my grandfather. That was awesome. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> you want the pastrami or not? <laughs> uh, in any event, <laughs> here's Jacoby <laughs> with the uh, first of football. <laughs> 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 how you feeling, Grandpa? <laughs> <laughs> first in football. Like, that's how everyone in my family reacted to the New York Jets the last few oh. weeks. <laughs> hey, Grandpa, how about the Jets? <laughs> hey, hey, Grandpa, how are, the, how are the Cowboys against the Arizona Cardinals? <laughs> well, this week they have the Patriots. It means Ezekiel Elliott will be back in Dallas, where he obviously played four years with Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott spoke about the reunion. Here he is. It's like a little brother. Uh, best friend, obviously. Uh, came into this thing together. Um, grew, grew on the field, off the field. Uh, yeah, uh, it was awesome. Honestly, it was awesome. Obviously, it was unfortunate him to go play for another team, but it's part of this business. Uh, we learned that pretty quick, and then uh, seeing it uh, when obviously we had to depart, uh, he departed. It's part of it, but uh, happy for him. Always pulling for him, and he's doing well. Excited for him. Zeke played pretty well against the Jets last week. Do you expect him to have a big game against his former team? Yeah, because that's one thing you know about Bill Belichick. He's aware of those things. Yep. He's aware of those side stories and the storylines of this game. And too, too, as you said, you know, he played pretty good, actually, mm -hmm. uh, last week. He had a couple big third-down carries for the Patriots, and clearly they trust him. I know he fumbled week one, yep. uh, but since then he's been pretty good. Uh, and if I'm Bill Belichick, you know, great players. And I think Zeke was great uh, in the prime of his career. To be fair, he's not, you know, Tony Dorsett. He's not Emmitt Smith, of course. He's the third best running back, though, I think, in Dallas Cowboy history. You know, he's got one more great game in him. If he does, it's this game. And my gut is that Bill Belichick 
plays into that. And not that he's going to get the ball 20 times because that goes outside, you know, what the blueprint is for how that offense is supposed to work. But there is no doubt if he has an opportunity to let Ezekiel Elliott shine, he's going to give him that chance to shine. Yeah, I think Ezekiel's going to struggle, believe it or not. You're talking about him and Dak both came into the league in 2016. They were like brothers to the point where Dak even admitted, like, hey, Zeke didn't have a driver's license nor a car. I would chauffeur him around for a year, right? So there's a relationship there on and off the field. And on top of that, I was a guy, believe it or not, when I played against the Pittsburgh Steelers as a Jet at MetLife, it took me a whole half to realize that I'm no longer with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Like, <laughs> like I, there was still a part of me that felt like I was going to die a Steeler. I was going right. to forever be a part of the black and gold. And I remember being at the coin toss, looking at Ben Roethlisberger, looking at Brett Kisu, and I was like, you guys are my family. Like, how? how <laughs> does it, it was like, why are we facing each other? Why are we facing each other? And it was a surreal feeling. It literally took me to halftime to be like, no, nah, I got to get after him. Like, I got I to gotta turn right. the switch off. So I think it's going to be a lot for him emotionally. Um, and especially, especially when you talk about Jerry possibly, you know, throwing a montage up of his They're going to put a video for it's sure. Be something. Yeah. The thing that I, I didn't realize, and I don't know why I forgot it, is it, it feels to me, and I, I'm wrong on it, that Elliott's been around a lot longer than Dak Prescott has. I don't know why I feel that way. I feel he said, that way. Yeah, he said little brother in the sound. I was like, little brother? Yeah, they yeah, came out yeah. of the same draft. Correct. Yeah, and yeah. I'm going, there's no way they got drafted the same exact year. But they did. So that's a friendship from draft day, sure. obviously through their entire careers up until this year. But for some reason, I had it in my mind that Elliott was there point. for a lot longer than Dak yeah, was. Yeah, and he's, he's not going to get 150 yards or break a 60 yard, but third and two, third and one, goal yeah. line, he can still fall forward. Don't be surprised. He's going to be in their red zone offense for sure. Yeah. They're going to try to get him a score if the game allows it. What would be really interesting is, you know, there's going to be 80,000, 90,000 people in Big D uh, for this game. He's going to get a standing ovation when he first gets introduced and walks out for with a coin toss or whatever it is. If he scores a touchdown... What do Cowboy depends fans do? Depends on the do? scoreboard. Dep depends They're on the numbers bowl. on the scoreboard. I don't know that they do. It depends on, depends on the scoreboard. If, if the Cowboys are up by three scores and Ezekiel gets one in, they might, they might clap. Anytime that guy comes back to the house that he so-called built, you boo that man. Right? To let him know the door is closed. We don't want you Jerry back. Jerry Jones is like, I, I built the house. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Jones is like, I, 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 right. they call Jerry I, I, I think they're going to retire girl. his number. Really? Yeah, I, I, I like ring of auto type. I think. Uh, I, I think. Well, you start off with retiring. Eventually, when he retires, you get to maybe the ring of honor thing. Uh, or I'm just being told they don't retire numbers. Is that right? Oh, well, yeah. Gotta, but you well, can't. There's Johnson's certain numbers that the first. there's certain numbers they put out of commission, though. I know 88 ain't one of them. Everybody gets to wear 88. <laughs> uh, but you know, there are certain numbers that you don't wear in Dallas for obvious reasons. We're moving on to second in football. I love this sound. Remember, this is the offensive coordinator for the Bears, Luke Getze. The Bears have not won a football game. And Justin Fields has looked terrible, but here is what the offensive coordinator for the Bears had to say about what they're doing in Chicago. No, I think we're in the process of, of building something special, <clears throat> and I think that we're in the phase of it's week three going into week four, and we're, we're going on to uh, find a way to attack Denver in a, in, a, in a completely different way than we did Kansas City. What, what part of the process of building something special is losing every game? Yeah, uh, it's, it's bad. I, I think they're step one I think so of, too. Yeah. of the process. Here's... Here's the reality, though, for the Chicago Bears. And there's a part of me that wants to feel bad for them, but I'm a Jet fan, so I just don't. <laughs> like, you're playing a team that just gave up 70, 70 points. In one game. So, unless you score 30 or 40, whatever you do is going to be mocked. Yes. Because they just gave up 70. Their season is over. They got nothing to play for. And they're in your building. So if Chicago wins this game, you know, 20 to 19, who cares? Both these franchises are dead for the season right now. But you're playing against a team that gave up 70. So what I want to know from Luke Getze is what part of what you're building from an offensive standpoint is special? Your quarterback regressed. He's going to be out of the league at this rate. He also blamed you. Remember that. He said <laughs> you're the problem, yeah. not him. Your offensive line ain't doing much to protect the kid. Your wide receivers aren't delivering what you thought they would. Sorry with DJ Moore and Chase Claypool, right? Yards. Look at the week after week. Yeah, passing passing yards. Yards. yeah. So he's averaging down there two turnovers a game. What's even wilder, and I said this yesterday, and I want to reiterate it. 
Ryan Poles didn't draft Justin Fields. So he's got no loyalty to exactly. him. Exactly. So, Justin, and I, this is where I agree with you. I think Justin Fields is on a shorter lease than people think. I think they're not going to sit around and tolerate this type of quarterback play because right now his athleticism hasn't done enough to, over, to overcome his deficiencies on offense. So, I will, I will be well, – I got a question for both of you guys then, real quick. Right now, straight up, don't even blink, don't think about it. Would you trade Justin Fields for Zach Wilson if you're the Bears? Yes. yes. If you're the Jets? Yes. yes. I would too. Yes. I'd make that Wait, trade I have right a quick now. question for you. If – what would your grandfather say about the Bears offense? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Yeah. Moving on quickly to third in football, our final first in football story, and that is this. We have the Niners. Bosa. They are hosting the Frisky Cardinals. Is there any chance the Cardinals keep this one close? Close? Yeah. Maybe. No. If you look at the spread, that's why I asked the question. Uh, what's the spread? Double digits? Yeah, 14. Oh, it's two touchdowns? Yeah. No. Did I? <laughs> look, uh, a quarter? Maybe. Uh, I know they're feeling good about themselves, but this is the same situation. For those of you that gamble, I would avoid this game like the play. You'll save your money for something else, like dinner perhaps. I don't know. Because you're coming off a huge upset win, yeah. and now you're going into the, the, the teeth of the mouth of the dragon, and they're better than the team that you, know, you just beat. So this is natural letdown. This has the, the, the makings of a blowout and an embarrassing game. All of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, wait. Cardinals just beat Dallas, played the Giants really tight, played Washington really tight. I give that team, competitive team, they don't quit, they don't roll over and die, and I get two touchdowns, save your money. This yeah. is a blowout. Yeah. Thank now, you for saying they that. may not cover the 14 till late, but they're going to cover it, and it's going to be a blowout, and everyone's going to forget that the Arizona Cardinals beat the Cowboys, and poor Dobbs will not be able to find his jersey yeah, in the yeah, store yeah. after the ball. They built, they built them this week. They're going to take them down after yeah. this week. That, yeah. That's exactly, exactly what's going to happen. By the way, one of the key games this weekend is not just the game in Buffalo between the Bills and the Dolphins. It's the AFC North. It's the Ravens hosting Ravens. the Cleveland Browns and the best defense in football. Should the Ravens be worried? Yeah. After this. <laughs> uh, listen, we got Willie Colon, we got David Jacoby, we got What's Lamar up? Jackson right there. They play the uh, Cleveland Browns, huge AFC North matchup. And Lamar was asked about this slow offensive start. Go ahead, guys. We're just trying to figure each other out right now. You know, uh, we didn't really play preseason, so we just trying to figure it out. You know, we just had one great game against Cincinnati. Piggyback, you know, um, go to Colts. Well, we played the Colts, and we just had a little mishaps. And that happens. You know, every game not perfect, but hope we clean it up Cleveland. I feel like the sky's the limit for us, like I always say. Look, it's, it's funny. They've been struggling offensively compared to what we thought they would be. Me included. I thought this was a 5,000-yard passing offense. He was going to be an MVP candidate. And they're not quite there yet. Injuries, of course, have been a big factor. You lose your starting running back. Odell Beckham has barely played for them with the ankle injury, etc. Zay Flowers is the real deal. Uh, best rookie wide receiver in football thus far, three games in, at least in you know, my opinion. But here's the problem. It's going to be very tough to evolve and grow in this particular week because you're going up against the best defense in football. So I would think, as you said, more of a barn burner game, yep. lower scoring game, you know, who makes the mistake first kind of game. Uh, and I think you're going to have to now rely a little bit more than I think they wanted to on Lamar running the ball himself. Yeah. You know, one part of his game that was Michael Vick-esque that we all fell in love with was as soon as he saw a gap, between the tackle and the guard, or the line opened up, ping, ricochet rabbit right through that, and it was a huge game. And I know they brought in all these wide receivers so that he didn't have to do that, so that he didn't put himself at risk of taking a huge tackle uh, from a middle linebacker or safety coming up to drop him on a big run. But the reality now is that your running game is not what you thought it was going to be due to injury. Your offense is not performing at the level we all thought it would this part of the season. And now you're going up against the best defense in football. The only remedy I can come up with is he's got to do more. Not only that, you, you, you signed him to the big contract for the, for the Baltimore Ravens to be Super Bowl contenders. If that's the case with the trade deadline coming up, you have to be in the buying business. You have to maybe go out and get a Devontae Adams. Because right now, this receiving mm. core you have right now isn't producing. OBJ... Yeah, but I'm going to count on that with you. I think if you're going to acquire an offensive player, you go get a Jonathan Taylor. You go get a running back. But I don't you don't need they, another wide receiver. But their running backs is the issue. It's the offensive line. They just can't get healthy. But if you're talking about an offense right now who needs to put up points, because their defense is good but not great. 
but they need to put up points. Nelson Aguilar isn't that guy anymore. No, he's not. He had Devin, a touchdown catch two weeks ago, sure. but he's not that guy. Devin Duvernay, you can't find him. You talk about Zay Flowers, yes. OBJ, no. So if you want, try to preserve uh, uh, Lamar, Lamar Jackson, yeah. you have to bring in another big-time receiver to give him an option because he doesn't have one. And else. what happened to Mark Andrews? Right. He's supposed yeah. to be the security blanket well, you that how healthy Chelsea he is, is for Mahomes, exactly. right? Yeah. So it's, everywhere. it's, again, what we alluded to a few segments ago. Yo, you don't just put all these pieces together and say, oh, they'll figure it out week one. And what Lamar said is also right. We have completely devalued the preseason where we're so worried about injuries. Yes. None of these guys play together. And as you could speak to mo- better than me and Jacoby, when you're wearing shorts and barely wearing pads, everybody looks good. Yep. Right? When you got to tackle someone or be tackled, the game changes. And I think you're going to see teams moving forward, maybe uh, you know, kind of reevaluate what preseason is because all these teams get off to a slow start. When you look at when you. That's a great point because he said, oh, you know, we didn't play much of the preseason. It's like, Lamar, it's week four. Right? Like, how much time do you need to warm up to figure it out? It's week well, four. Well, me and Greg, and Greg Jennings is going to test when he gets here, it takes the offensive longer. But this is why, especially when I was in Pittsburgh, man, we used to laugh at guys who used to shine during pre, uh, spring training, right? You see guys in shorts, they look all glossy and fast. Like, man, that guy's going to be a killer. Right. And then training camp come in, it's full live and the bullets are hot. People are just like, what happened to number 12 from April? Where is he? <laughs> Can't find him on tape. Right. But to Lamar's point, he's saying, hey, man, we, we needed more time in the offseason. We didn't get that done. We didn't weren't able to do what we were supposed to do in the preseason. So this is kind of the, 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 the goo of it all. They are still growing. They are still maturing. However, I don't think Lamar Jackson has time because the way his contract is structured, they want to see instant offense. They want to see him produce now. They don't want to hear about the fumbles, which he's, he's capable of, and he did last week. They don't want to hear about the offensive roles. Craig, he has to get better. You said the quiet part out loud is – Lamar Jackson used to be an explosive runner. He used to get him in space. He used to make people look foolish, make a miss. Think in your head, because we all watch the games, when was the last time you saw Lamar Jackson in space just make someone miss? Well, he scored that one rushing touchdown early in the first quarter against the Colts, but other than that, he's just been Remember those 60-yard runs? Remember you make Well, they rebuilt this team to avoid him having to do that. Because the longevity. There's a part of me that's like, hey, Lamar, we we need you to do that again. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. by the way, that's right. If I'm Todd Munkin, and this is a huge game, right? I mean, you win this game, you're in first place. And depending on what Cincinnati does, we'll get to them in a second. You, know, you have a multiple game lead yeah. over the team that most people thought was the, uh, the best team in the division uh, coming into this year. Uh, I got to go back to instincts. I got to go back to what I'm just naturally good at. I think most players feel that way, too. Like, if I'm, if I'm in the NBA, if I'm a shooter, I shoot. Yep. In the NFL, we tried to make me a pocket quarterback by adding all these weapons. The weapons aren't performing. They're half of them are hurt, and half right. They're not available. So I got to now go back a little bit, maybe not extremely, all the way back. But if I'm Lamar Jackson, I got to get back to my roots. What am I best at? Making plays outside of the pocket or using my legs to change the defense. And going against the Cleveland Browns, I'm telling you now. If he thinks he's standing in that pocket for three no, and a half that seconds, ain't that no. ain't happening. Nope. No. He's going to be on his ass more than he is not <laughs> on his ass. Yeah, and that's the whole goal for this Browns defense, especially when you got Raekwon Swift, Rohan Swift coming out saying, hey, man, we're going to beat you up in front of your family. It, they, they, it's a statement game, right? Yeah. The Browns are trying to capture the flag. They're trying to let the world know, even Deshaun Watson, that we are them. Look out. Well, and that's the flip side of this. All the attention we're giving right now is about the great Cleveland defense going up against a struggling offense in Baltimore. But let's flip the script just real quick sure. before we get to Cincinnati. Deshaun Watson has not been the guy. They are now sitting there with a chance to be in first place without great quarterback play out of Deshaun Watson, who they gave guaranteed quarter of a billion dollars to. There comes a point where if I'm Cleveland and I got this great defense, y'all better not waste it because (laughs) my defense gives me a chance. I'm going to be in every game we play this year. When does the quarterback start stepping up and play like the guy we paid? And you never thought Deshaun Watson would be the X factor, right? Meaning that at the same time, he can win you games, he can lose you games. He has to get better. And if I'm Kevin Stefanski, you're going to have to figure out ways that this offense can come alive. Because I'm telling you right now, if Lamar gets hot, as we know he can with the run game, this is going to be a tough day for Bob. All right, so those are the – that's head-to-head, of course. That's going to be Baltimore and Cleveland, which brings me to Cincinnati. Let's stay in the AFC North, nice and focused here. They play the Tennessee Titans. I will tell this Joe Burrow was dead right earlier in the week when he goes look one and two sounds a lot better than 0 and three he's right 0 and three you're talking about where we're vacationing uh you know for New Year's one and two we're still alive <laughs> all right 
can they get to two and two? Yeah, of course they can. But the question is the health of Joe Burrow. Here's good news. If you're a Bengal fan, according to the Cincinnati Bengals, he was a full participant in Bengals practice. Meaning what? I don't know what that means other than he was on the field the entire practice, yeah. Yeah. but I think he has been what for a every What jersey on, by yeah, the exactly. way. That means yeah. don't touch me. Well, it, it walked through. Yeah. He walked yeah. through fully. Yeah. Now, yeah. the claim is that a week ago he was on the field but didn't do anything. Yesterday, throughout this week, he was taking snaps and running the first team offense. Look, here's the reality. I'm not telling you something you don't already know he is week to week right if he takes a couple hits maybe he's hobbled and does miss a game at some point before the bye week if he stays healthy which would be miraculous considering uh the fact that he's really playing on one leg uh great for the Cincinnati Bengals huge game though you're talking about the third worst rushing defense in football right now the Bengals going up against a team that typically runs the ball very well Plus, you've got a frustrated Derrick Henry, had 11 carries and 20 yards last Wasn't week. Happy. Not happy so I that guarantee happened. you, heavy dose of Derrick Henry against a team that currently doesn't stop the run. I don't want to tackle angry Derrick Henry. That is not something I want to see. <laughs> I don't want to tackle a happy Derrick yeah. Henry. <laughs> yeah. 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 By the way, my form, if I try to tackle him, you know what my grandfather would say? Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. But I, yeah. I want to show you what the, uh, the Bengals are playing for. Throw it up. Let's throw up the schedule real quick if we can. Yep. What they're doing right now, they're playing to get to the bye week, right? Because that, that's in, in their minds, it's like, man, if we can get through Tennessee, we know we can possibly beat the Cardinals. Who knows? It's going to be a toss-up. Seahawks may be a loss. But the bye week, they're trying to get Joe Burrow healthy enough to take that run because after that bye week, it gets ugly and nasty for the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about the Niners, the Bills. Texans are a better team. Can't sleep on Texans. But you got Baltimore. You got Baltimore, Baltimore and you got the Steelers. Steelers. And the Jacksonville you know, Jaguars, whenever they decide to wake up. The bottom line is – they have to survive three games. Can they survive three games and get him healthy enough into the bye week where they could possibly get him healthy enough to make yeah, it? Yeah, well, let's keep it real. The goal has got to be can we get to 500? That's got to be the goal. The goal is not, obviously, you want to win every game. That's silly. Uh, you, the goal is can we go 2 and 1 here in the next three games, get to that bye week at 500, very much alive to still win the division right. and all the things we want to accomplish? Because you're right. If you are under 500, meaning you're one and five or two and four, going into the bye week, when you come out, it's a murderer's row. Yeah, you ain't Bad. beating San Francisco with a banged up Burrow. You're not beating the Buffalo Bills with a banged up Joe Burrow, and then your season's over. So I agree. The goal for them, I don't care how you want to slice it and dice it, you want to give them the win against Tennessee, a win against Arizona, a loss against Seattle, I think you sign up for that today. If you're a Bengals fan, Three and three into the bye gives you a chance at still doing something. Let me come off the top rope with this question: If the, he comes, if he goes into the bye two and four, do you have to save him because of, because if of the murders? Unless you tell me that he healed up and the calf is great. If you're two and four into the bye week, I do not play him against San Francisco. Right. The fact of the matter is, what's, dis what's disappointing about this whole situation is, after this Sunday, we're going to ask ourselves two questions about the Bengals: Did they win? Yep. Did Joe get hurt? And that's how I feel each game is now. Did they yeah. win? How's Joe doing? Yeah, well, he I, ain't going to tell you with his body language. He's just going to put his shoulders up 50 times. He's like, I'm okay. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm okay. Look, outside of a car taking him off, he's going to tell you he's playing every single week, yeah. right? And one quick note. Joe Burrow, the great Joe Burrow, is completing 55% of his passes. It's because of the cat. That is, that is Zach Wilson-esque. That ain't Joe Burrow, and that's a major problem in Cincinnati. You have to figure out how to get to 500 before that bye week, and it ain't going to be easy. When I say easy, I'm not talking about my first girlfriend either. I'm talking about <laughs> yeah. the Detroit Lions Lions. beating the Green Bay Packers last night at Lambeau Field. We'll break that game down for you. Tell you what it means about Detroit and Green Bay going forward. Plus, we got the Dallas Cowboys trying to get back in the win column against the New England Patriots all right after this. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah! Welcome back to the Woo! Show. We have your headlines, and we start with what happened last night. Guess what happened? The Lions got in the end zone over and over and over again. They made light work of the Green Bay Packers, and Green Bay Packers head coach after the game took to the podium and was asked, hey, coach, what happened in the first half when you guys got waxed? Well, guess what? He didn't like the line of questioning. Here he is. I mean, you saw it, Pete. I mean, we got kicked. If I knew, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> that's a BS question. Oh, 
Oh, I don't he's like upset. No he's very oh, upset. But I don't have Aaron Rodgers anymore. <laughs> oh, That's I don't what like I wanted to get to. They, they go from Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers to Jordan Love. Jordan Love looked good in preseason. Yeah. He looked good early on in the season. He looked bad last night. What do you think Jordan Love's future is as the franchise quarterback? Well, I mean, let's, let's be fair to Jordan Love. He's essentially a rookie quarterback, right? Yes. And rookie quarterbacks have their ups and downs. This is not a referendum on Jordan Love's ultimate career because he is shown some flashes of being a really good quarterback as well. Led the comeback, of course, last week. Down 17-0 against the Saints. It was a bad game for their offensive line with no Bakhtiari out there on the left side uh, helping protect him. They couldn't run the ball at all. They probably didn't even try to be fair. Only had 10 carries uh, from their running backs last night. And I want to call your attention to this. Uh, I, I just brought up the drives because I'm watching the game last night like you guys are. And I'm like, wait a minute. They barely even had the ball in the first half. They had one total yard in the first quarter and only 20 yards, 20 yards for the first half of football. Just real quick. First drive after the interception. The interception, they gave right. the ball. They started the ball on the, uh, on the uh, 16-yard line of Detroit. Let's get a touchdown right there nope. and set the tone. You came to our house. You got to deal with us. You know, early interception by Jared Goff. A minute 35, drive one. One minute six, drive two. A minute 34, drive three. The interception on the next drive, a 16-second drive. A minute 41. They had one drive that was two minutes or longer in the entire first half. The game was a wrap. They couldn't run the ball. They didn't try to run the ball. Their offensive line was terrible. Yeah. And while I give them a little bit of credit that they at least fought back and then roll over and die in the second half. And we're a two-point conversion away from getting within eight and making it a one-score game, at least midway through the fourth quarter. They were just beaten in every facet of the game by, get this right, the better team. Yep. Detroit's really good. And outside of a couple of mistakes against Seattle and losing in overtime in that high-scoring game a couple of weeks ago, you're talking about the Lions being 4-0 and the class of the NFC. Yeah, I mean, there was 11 hits on Jordan Love, but there's one play in particular that shows you that Detroit Lions are here to stay, right? And this is what I'm trying to show you. Jared Goff, we talked about the chip on his shoulder once he left the Rams. But here we go right here. This is a reverse. You freeze it right here. Yeah. Bam! This is how you win the locker room, Carton. Why? Because we have a quarterback wanting to stick his face in the fan and block a defensive lineman. So your running back by the name of Khalif Raymond can scamper for 40 yards. This is why the Detroit Lions are about team. It's about we, not me. Great finish, great run, Detroit Lions. And that happened in the first quarter. 40 seconds left, it was first and 10. And when you got Jared Koff saying, hey, man, now he couldn't listen. He could have said, got out the way. He's like, no, he got rolled like cheap carpet. But it was for the sake of the team, Carton. It was for the team. I like it. The man like put it. the team on his back. I'm taking off your second drink, get it? <laughs> and here's what you and I know about film study uh, the next day. They will show that 10 oh. times, oh, yeah. and Ten the linemen times. are going to love it. Like, you're my guy, bro. You <laughs> saw you took that guy. <laughs> right, bro. You got knocked on your ass like <laughs> a champion. Right. Right. You got rolled like a loose But joint. look, here, here's the reality. This Again, I want to be clear. This is more about the Detroit Lions than it is the Green Bay Packers, right? Yes. And yes. Matt LaFleur can uh, whine and moan and curse out reporters all he wants. This is what it's like when you don't have a guaranteed rock star at quarterback who's an on-field coach as much as you are on the sideline. You know, sometimes you get a little soft, you get a little greedy, right? Yes. You had Aaron Rodgers, you had Brett Favre, uh, and now you're with Jordan Love, who might very well become a really good quarterback. But this is what it's like for most franchises, right? Mm -hmm. When you don't have the rock star Hall of Fame level quarterback. The Detroit Lions are really, really good. Green Bay lost to a really, really good football team. And what's interesting, you know, this uh, the Lions were favored by a point and a half, which is why I thought that they were going to win the game. You know, to be favored on the road against at Lambeau hadn't happened in six years and doesn't happen often for any team, right? Detroit at some point is going to start earning the respect of everyone around the league and fan bases around the league because they are really good at just about everything. If I did a poll right now of NFL fans, tell me the number two wide receiver for the Lions. You can't answer that question. You guys can, yeah. but most of America can't. Tell me who their running backs are. 
Most guys can't answer that question, right? Uh, and that's the reality of what they've built there. They've built a team that's what you just said, we, not me. Yep. Like, who's their star player? You can name one, you know, on defense, Amara, right? Yeah. Right. Hutchinson. But the reality is that they're just a really good team, and they happen to be very well prepared, very well coached, and they don't make the major mistake that is an Achilles heel, the turnover, which usually takes them out of games. And this is, oh, go ahead. One other thing I love about that is their quarterback's journey has sort of been like the team. You know, remember sure. Jared Goff goes Super Bowl, lose, and then they say, we have to get rid of him. He's gone, forgotten. He's kind of like a throw in the Matt Stafford trade. I guess they need a quarterback. I didn't expect Jared Goff to then take this offense and turn it into what it is. They slept on, gone, forgotten, all, you know, considered to be a loser, and then slowly building, getting better, getting better, getting better, and now they are going to win the NFC North. Not just that. You know, you can also judge, I think, a lot of times, their true value of a quarterback specifically by who he's dating. <laughs> and in this case, like, you should have known that Jared I Goff. I brought up Jared bro, Goff. you should have known. I did. You should have known. I did this. You treat her like Kelly Kapowski. That's how you treat her. Like, oh, she's just off the wall with a big heart yeah. on her face. I listen, I was going to say, yo, average middle and journeyman quarterbacks don't date Christian Harper. <laughs> we should have known. And here's the other thing. When he moved to Detroit from L.A. and she went with that should have been all we needed to know <laughs> about how good a quarterback Jared Goff could be. He's my favorite I quarterback in the league. I don't think you're getting invited league. to the wedding. Quickly, I don't think you're getting an invite. I hope so. <laughs> and quickly, I want to give Man Campbell some credit because he did a great thing in building his culture. Like, he he hired Antoine Randall to get to take care of the receivers. He has Aaron Glenn running mm. the defense. Yeah, like, good point. He former has players. Four, he has former players Everywhere. teaching players, just like B.A. Bruce Aarons used to do. So, I love that. And culture. by the way, speak to this real quick because I'm glad you brought that yeah. up. He didn't bring in guys that played 50 years ago yes. either. He yeah. talked about guys that played against some of the dudes who were still in the played league. Against him when he was yeah. playing. So yeah. I think that's a, the, w meaning these dudes can relate to today's athlete. And today's athlete is different than athletes in the 80s. So I think that's also a very smart move. No, I, I love it also from this standpoint that the fact that a lot of these guys who have now have headsets, they can empathize and sympathize for what it was. And we listen, Anton Wendell, he was with the Steelers with me. Aaron Glenn was a Jet. A lot of these guys went through ups and downs in his career. Sure. So they, 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 they joined the team who has literally come alive. Yeah, by the way, I keep mentioning his fiance because I'm hoping one oh, day God. We'll we're, going back, we're going back to her again. I'm just like, I, hey, she's hot now. All right, time I, to move on. Time to move on from <laughs> Jared Goff's fiance back to the headlines in the world of sports. Sorry if I have to keep this on the rails here. And we're going to talk about, guess what? The Dallas Cowboys. They got waxed by the Cardinals. They do host the Patriots. But that man, Dak Prescott, spoke about the disappointment that was the loss in Arizona. Here is the quarterback with the star in his helmet. Yeah, I'm always pissed off after a loss. I don't know if we can rate my different levels of pissed offness, um, <laughs> but yeah, it sucks. It really does. Um, I, you don't do anything, you know what I'm saying, with the idea of losing or thinking you're going to lose, and until the that last second, you know what I mean. It's not really a reality in your head, and so uh, yeah, we're pissed off. So uh, they look great at week one, look great in week two, lost to the Cardinals in week three. How much pressure is there on the Dallas Cowboys to win against the Patriots? Well, look, I think there's always pressure on the Dallas Cowboys when the expectation is that we're good enough to go to a Super Bowl, which we all believe that they are. Even with the Diggs injury, they're still really, really good. You got San Francisco kind of lurking out there, though. San Francisco plays Arizona. We all believe San Francisco is going to win that game and not fall prey to like, like the Cowboys did. You know, I would have said this would be a much tougher game for them had they beaten Arizona because they're all looking ahead you know, to the game against San Francisco. But you don't have the luxury of doing that now. I think the refocus, I think they own the mistakes they made in that embarrassment, specifically, you know, the run defense, uh, giving up 200 yards on the, run, on the ground against Arizona. The, the huckleberry here, though, is red zone offense, and here's why. You know, they've only converted three of their last 11 red zone trips into touchdowns, which is the league's worst. You can't just say, we're going to do this, and that automatically fixes the output of scoring inside the red zone. It just doesn't work that way, right? Mm -hmm. So you can put in different plays. You can look at schemes that didn't work uh, and all that kind of stuff. But you can't just wave a magic wand and say, oh, we'll do this, and it's a guarantee to score. So the pressure, I think, that does exist on the Dallas Cowboys is first and 10 from New England's 19. Mm. Okay, you're inside the red zone now. What are you going to do? 
Because every time they settle for a field goal, you're going to hear 80,000 people rumbling. Again, we couldn't get the ball in the end zone. We're keeping them in it. You know, we're a play away from being on the wrong end of this thing. That's the pressure for me. And that does fall on Mike McCarthy's shoulders because he's calling the plays. Yep. And then ultimately, Dak Prescott and executing whatever play is called. Like, you know, when we talk about the interception in the end zone that we keep showing, and we're putting that on Dak, rightfully so, it's a horrendous pass. But then the, then the conversation turns to, well, how come Mike McCarthy didn't call a better play? We've shown this play a hundred times this week. The running back's wide open. Open receivers, yeah. <laughs> like, is Dak Prescott, watch this play. We're going to show it to you again. The, we showed it a little late, so you can take off the screen. It doesn't matter. Like, right there on the flat, bang. 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 He is open and probably scores, or worst case scenario, he's down to Back the one or two. two. Yeah. Right? So, to me, this Even is... Even underneath, he could bang to the... Yep. Yeah. yeah. The so tight end right here, coming across, 87. Yeah. Like, there's a window right there. He's just banging on him. Yeah. So, that's an example where... Mike McCarthy's taking some of the blame for it, but you could watch that play and recognize running back open very quickly, slant tight end open. Dak made a bad decision. Dak made a bad play. To be fair to Dak, though, and we've watched every play of every Cowboy game this year, that's the second time only that he made a predetermined read and threw it into you know, yep. the kind of the mouth of the lion. The other time he did it, Sauce Gardner dropped it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the only time he's really made those mistakes. But also, I mean, it, I mean, if you got to look at the whole body of work, like they won in time of possession, they were better in yards, yep. they were better in a lot of other categories. So when you look at right now, for you can see it right here, 75 to their 53. They only lost by 12. They had 26 first downs. Arizona only had 20. They had 416 yards. Yada yada yada. The point is, what we got to understand is, Bill Belichick is going to do one thing. He's going to take away their best weapon, and that's going to be Ceedee Lamb. So what's next for the Dallas Cowboys? How does Dak evolve from that? Because you can't go into this game not knowing that Bill Belichick, the big brain, like I like to call him, is going to eliminate a lot of options. Right. And he you. can't just be give Tony Pollard the ball. Exactly. That's right. not going to be that's going to be realistic. So can they overcome that? Because that's going to happen. So we'll see. But I think Dak is going to have a good game. I do too. But I think it's going to be it's going to be a tough sled in, uh, yeah, early. I think they win too. I think they they go into San Francisco, you know, uh, three and one. I think they'll be just fine. All right. Moving on to our third headline, and it is the biggest game in week. Four. It is the AFC matchup between the Dolphins, who just put up 70 points in a game, Ow. and that man, Josh Allen, and the Buffalo Bills. It is in Buffalo. This is a huge game, not just in the East, but in the AFC as a whole. Along with the Chiefs, do you consider the winner of this game the favorites in the AFC? No, I don't. I think they become the favorites to win the division. I'll give you that, that they become the kings in the moment of the AFC East. But there's so much more football to be played. And we can't do what a lot of people want us to do and just anoint the team in week four, week five as now the best team in the conference. Until somebody tells me that Kansas City's dead and they've stopped playing, they're the team to beat in the AFC. And I don't really care what their record is. Until they're eliminated, they are the team to beat. Yo, I disagree with your assertion, though, that this is by far the best game of the weekend. It's one of them. It's one of them. I think Cleveland Baltimore is right there with it. It's a great slate. I really do. I'm (laughs) upset there at the same time. I'm upset there at the same time. That is a good point. Yeah. 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 You know, flex this early. Well, he's doing well enough. You can buy a second TV. (laughs) Uh, That being said, look, this game is a great game, obviously. The question really becomes human nature. When you score 70 points, and now you're going against a much better opponent that can match you and match your offense on most days, what's the letdown like? You know, the one thing we saw in Miami, the only real adversity they've had this year was defensively against the Chargers, Mm. right? Mm. And the Chargers proved that a really good quarterback with actual weapons can take advantage of what is the only weakness I can see on Miami's uh, side of the ball, which is their defense, their pass defense, right? So I know that Josh Allen's going to have a big day. My gut is that Stephon Diggs has a big day. I think you're going to get as much as I do respect the Bills' defense, a high-scoring, back-and-forth kind of game. Last team with the Rock wins. And I think, uh, you know, you tell me Miami wins, I buy it. Tell me Buffalo wins, I buy it. I would lean to Buffalo because they're at home uh, as opposed to Miami uh, because at some point they're going to lose the game. Someone's going to find that Achilles heel and take advantage of it. And remember, if the Chargers had an average defense, they win that game. Mm -hmm. Their defense was pathetic and embarrassing, (laughs) right? And Miami took advantage of it. But I think this is a great game. I think Buffalo wins it. 
And then you're looking at a real battle all year long for who wins that division. I think it's intimidating. You're talking about this Miami Dolphins offense that's averaging 40 points a game, man. And when you come off the win, a big win against, I don't know if it's a big win because the Broncos suck. Right. When you put up those amount of points, it makes you wonder how much do they have left, right? Like, you hope this team doesn't become stagnant and realize, like, you know, you don't want them to see them stall out. But I think Tua and Mike McDaniel, they're going to capture the flag. They want this to be a statement game. They want it to be a get-back game, especially since they lost last year in the playoffs. And now they have Tua. So I got the Dolphins, uh, but I think Buffalo's going to put up a good fight. All right, before we get out of here for Undisputed Live from Boulder, Colorado, the guys have their Friday morning picks oh, for yeah. the weekend. Uh, Jacoby uh, finally got a couple wins back. Hot back. streak. Come on, hot Who streak. Who do you like on Sunday, kid? I have three straight wins, uh, to be fair, after five straight losses. And I have the Eagles making easy work of the commanders. Sam Howell threw, what, four picks last That's week? Bad. I can't imagine them turning around. The Eagles have a great roster. They take this one easily. Take the win. All right, so Eagles uh, stay unbeaten and go to 4 and oh, yeah. Willie Colon. I got the game we talked about and been talking about all day. That's the Ravens going against the Cleveland Browns. I think That's the right. Browns defense is going to be too much. The all really? Yeah, I think the offense for the Ravens is still is, is eh, if you will. Eh. <laughs> so, eh. And I think Deshaun Watson is going to have the game. This is a big game for Deshaun Watson. He has, he has to agree. show up. Because he's going up against the best defense in football. Uh, I'm sorry, he has the best defense yeah, in best football. Yeah. <laughs> and because of that, he's just got to make a couple plays, and it should be good enough to get just a W. To get and that's going to be the story, I think, of the Browns. Before we get out of here, uh, can the Jets keep it close against the Chiefs? Yes, because Taylor Swift is going to be in the building. Yes! Get it. That's, it. That's it. That's it. Where's the penalty flag? Uh, have yourselves a great weekend. If you're going to wager, be smart about it. Don't chase bad losses.